and one is this sort of workshop agenda, which would be um, I know maybe uh, right. amended to five foot one or something. Maybe? Yeah, five foot one. Okay. Okay. So with those changes, just we move the agenda. So moved. Thank you, Maureen. Second. Thank you, Allison. All in favor? Yep. Okay. Unanimous. Um, so, uh, adoption of minutes. Hopefully, everybody's read them. Anybody have any changes or questions? All right. Just on page five, in the last cluster bullet points, it says third bullet points: seasonable communities. Does that mean seasonal? Probably. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. <laughs> Mm, okay. It sounded nice. Yeah. 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 We could live in a seasonable community. Like amenable? Applicable? Yeah. As long as it's not unsold and petrol Okay. Okay. Motion to approve. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Seconded. Can I second this one? Yes. I can. Okay, I'll second them. They're in. All in favor? Yep. Approved. Okay. So minutes done. Um, public comments, no members of the public present. Um, <coughs> so review of action items. I'm going to ask that if we could um, defer these for next time because we want to go straight into the workshop. So if anybody, if they don't hear any strong objections, we'll defer those, 4.1 and 4.2. Um, and then we'll get straight into uh, 5, which is the workshop. Um, and you'll have the sort of rough agenda that uh, we created. So uh, Daniel and Fritz and I met a couple of times in the last couple of weeks and created this agenda. So hopefully what we're planning to work through today. Um, so, and we came up with, um, and I'm happy for these to evolve or change now, but the purpose of the meeting uh, being for this committee to review and discuss relevant sections of the land use bylaw and official community plan um, for a commu from a community housing perspective. And I put a link there to the terms of reference. If we need to, we can quickly look at those together uh, and provide feedback to staff as part of an overall land use bylaw review, which is underway at the moment. So the goal of the meeting is to provide overarching, you know, vision, idea, direction, level type of suggestions for the land use review. Um, so for example, how to achieve housing that we feel the community needs uh, with, a specific, with a few specific examples how, of how that could be achieved. So when we were talking in our prep meetings, we got into a lot of details and we realized, you know what, in the two and a half, three hours we have together and with the expertise room, we're not going to get to the level of, okay, this and this and this and this, like going through every single line and anything and, and making suggestions. But we thought there could be overarching visions, overarching goals, which is stuff that we have talked about in previous meetings. And then there could be several specific examples. So not that we've taken a comprehensive line by line review, but that we have pulled some examples to give some direction to staff and that we've given some overall direction. Like for example, one of them being, you know, how do we incentivize the housing we want to get as opposed to, you know, or how does the existing one not incentivize that? So those kind of, you know, bigger principles. And with the, the hope that the outcome and the output that we'll have at the end of this uh, would be some sort of brief, and I mean, I'm talking like two pages, not, not a massive report, but just sort of um, a summary of what we sort of um, got to at the end, which is these overarching objectives and then several, you know, examples. And again, I'm very happy to be adaptable and let's see how the workshop goes. If that changes or, or we get into more depth, great. Um, and just to conclude some considerations, these came up in our prep was looking at various time frames. So short as in like immediate, medium term, which we sort of equated with say the council term of kind of three to four years, and then more long term ones, just keeping those in mind as we look at things. And through a housing lens, um, but not to exclude, you know, transportation services, utilities, the environment. Um, yeah, so just keeping all those other factors in mind. Um, okay. So that was kind of my introduction. And I hoped, do we have, oh, do we bring the post-its and markers I can and do stuff that. like that? Yeah, Steph, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so the idea is that uh, Fritz is going to do a review of the OCP. We thought we'd start with that, because that's really the overarching um, document. Uh, and then we'll jump into just a little intro to municipal tools. And I thought we might even just write those up on the whiteboard, just more that they're going to be things we'll touch on through our discussion, not so much a comprehensive review, but just to remind. And there's a few definitions that I think might be useful. Like I know I would like to hear a few definitions um, that Daniel 
audience going to discuss, and then we'll get into the, the meat of it, um, which is the land use bylaw review. Bob isn't here. He had talked about some of his, so let's see if we touch yes. on number five is, um, um, with him is, uh, not being here. Uh, and then we can look at number six, which is the process yeah, and challenges, yes. which we sort of talked about um, a few times. Yeah, so, yes. Oh, is this different from what I, this is my image at home. Yeah, our stops after considerations. Yeah, on the other side. Oh, on the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. Oh. That's exhausting. So that's that's where we're up to. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, I mean, if we get into a robust discussion, hopefully we'll finish earlier than noon. But um, you know, that's the time allowed. So let's see where our discussion takes us. So. Fritz, oh, it's up here. Do you want to? Well, that's just one graphic, right? Yeah, and that's more the land use file. Yeah, I was only updated after the last meeting. Yeah. Because there's some errors in it that um, Daniel picked up, you know? But um, <clears throat> maybe as a start, like, um, see, these are my notes, right? And you go through every piece of the land use file on OCP. And it was really only seen from a housing point of view because, it, well, that was the focus. Right? Mm -hmm. because like, and then when you do that, you first pick up bits and pieces, and it actually takes quite a while before you start to kind of comprehend the big picture. Mm -hmm. And to give a summary is actually really difficult, mm -hmm. because like, um, at first it's okay, you know, and then you have to condense it, which is even more difficult. Right. Right? So it is almost more like, how do you make people feel that something actually is not really uh, ready as a tool, you know, for us to achieve uh, you know, housing objectives. So I started writing that some policies in the OCP enable development of a variety of forms of housing and affordable housing, while other OCP policies prevent these intended developments. So like if you, it's almost like if you're a community, you, you can't want everything and things are actually competing with each other. It, you, you do have to provide clarity and a sense of priority. And that is probably one of the things that are kind of key. Um, the, and, then, and then what I thought to do is not necessarily go through it the way it's supposed to go, but I thought it's more an awareness thing. You mean that you know that some things are just, the OCP actually enables some things, and, you know, and Daniel's completely aware of that, right? And um, other things don't. So then I thought, if you would ask me today what I want the most what are one of the most important tools that council has available, you know, or the community has available? I would say, to realize housing objectives, BRM should use effective tools that the OCP already provides. It's in the existing OCP. It's called amenity zoning and multi-tier zoning. I'm sorry, what is this? Amenity zoning? It's in, or actually, yeah, it's actually in the email that, I can send the email to everybody. This is just like, it's all in here. Yeah, I'll get them. You can just email you. Um, so amenity zoning is used extensively in other places, and Bowen Island, the OCP, actually enables it, which is the idea that you have two-level zoning. You have a base zoning, which only allows which people can do outright. You know, you just comply with the zoning bar and you can do it. And then there's a second level, or maybe even a third level, that uh, encourages people to do things, and yes, they get bonuses. Like they get Wolfgang more. built Kate's Hill Chapel, for example? Yeah, an amenity can be anything. So the amenity is more like, it could be anything that's in the interest of the municipality, and I think historically that was a little bit more limited, but now more and more you notice that if it's an amenity and council accepts that, then it is enough to make something happen. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, yes, if you allow a subdivision and with it's subject to building, you know, a chapel or, you know, a Trail a school, theater, whatever. you know, yeah. whatever, right? It, yeah. It's all good. And if something for some reason wouldn't fly, then it would be picked up in the process anyway. You know what I mean? It's not yes. going to happen. And Alison, it could be at a small scale, like you may build a house of 2,000 square feet. If you build a secondary suite that's ready to rent, you may build oh. an extra thousand. Yeah, but that is, that is not really amenity zoning. Oh, that's like, not amenity. Okay, good. I'm glad no, we're clarifying. No, you actually just touched on it because exactly. amenity zoning yeah. is much broader and it allows for general amenity for the community. Okay. In the so past, they said in the past they said more. It had to be specific for the neighborhood that it's in, but I think that is. 
But it couldn't what Robin's soul. talking about be considered for the community? Sorry? If couldn't what's Robin talking about be considered for the larger community? Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's the different? other one. That is oh, yeah. different mechanism. No, and, and, and the reason why it's different is that amenity zoning is a longer process. It normally has something to do with uh, you know rezoning or variances or I mean things that are harder to achieve, like right. subdivision, whatever, right? Okay. But the um, but multi-tier zoning is more simple because you can embed it in the zoning. But zoning means that is what you can do or should be able to do if you meet conditions. Okay. Right? So for instance, if you want to build a house and there is an outright zone, and it is that say it gives you a certain floor space and a certain height, and you just want to have a single family house and nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. Then it allows you less square footage. And in some municipalities, like the district of North Vancouver, except actually it has a maximum house size, but I haven't seen anything yet that relaxes that. But what I'm mm -hmm. saying is that if you got a maximum house size, for instance, it doesn't have to be the same in every neighborhood. It can be different, it can be specific for neighborhoods. And then let's say that would be, I just give a number, okay? Let's say it would be 2,000 square feet or so, right? But you can have another 1,000 square feet if you do the following. You provide secondary suite, or you provide yes. this or that, you know. And what's that called? Well, it is more like two tier zoning. Two tier. But yeah. it doesn't have to be two tiers, it could be more than two, but for simplicity, let's call it two tier zoning. Okay. Right? Or multi tier. You said uh, multi tier zoning. Yeah, multi tier yeah. zoning, I prefer that word. But so the idea is that that is embedded in the land use bible, which is, which is actually, you, you read it, you can do that, and the outright means that if you just draw it and you submit it, and if you meet all the requirements from the zoning bylaw and the building bylaw, you get a permit, right? The, the normally, the, um, to get in the second tier, it's normally conditional because planning staff, like Danielle, mm -hmm. would have to review that it meets the objectives from the community and then confirm that, you know, like there, there are actually examples in, uh, in the code, for instance, if um, if you relax something, right? Like for instance, the, the, the distillery or something, and you say, yes, they can have this and that as long as they put more rental housing. On. That, is, that actually is amenity zoning. Mm -hmm. And if you formulate that clearly, if it's clear to, to applicants um, that it exists and what the opportunities are, mm -hmm. and if there is a process that you can get a, a condition, like, that you can get some confirmation that you're on the right track, that you're not going to waste like two years or something, right? And all kinds of money. Then, then that works, you know? And it, it is more like if you, as a council, take control of the tools that you have, then yes, you would be, uh, you can be more effective. And then in one of the last meetings with, um, with Robin and Danielle, we also did, uh, said from, okay, um, you can distinguish between uh, time frame, for instance, like if there's a new council, right? What are the things that a new council could do like right away, right? Or what could be done in a four year term? Mm -hmm. Or what do you actually enable for the future? And that enabling for the future in the, in the long run is actually the most important, right? Because then, um, you know, we don't have an outdated OCP that somehow doesn't enable what you want to do. So anyway, so then um, those are due, uh, then, then I wrote an, another effective method to carefully introduce new forms of development to a neighborhood area is spot zoning, used by the city of North Vancouver. Like a pilot project, it permits a neighborhood to test a specific form of development. I kind of wrote it like that, but in, I, I, I give you an example. The city of Vancouver uses a blanket zone. That means the whole zone applies to thousands of houses at the same time. Right? And that has its pros and cons. You're more effective, of course, because you affect a lot of things in one big bang. But it also takes many years to go through that whole process. And it is politically far more difficult, right? Because it's such a broad sweep. What the last <coughs> council did in Vancouver by zoning all single family duplex, which I think is amazing, actually, I really like it. Um, uh, they just did it at the end of the term. They didn't give a shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> they did. They, they, there was not oh, really yeah, a proper a process, right? They just, they just did it. They just did it, right? And then they were yeah. uh, defeated. But anyway. Um, well, yeah, you want to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to ask a couple of questions, Fritz. Um, you said that amenity zoning is one of the things that um, is anticipated in the current OCP. Is that? 
and then it's in there. It's 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 embedded in there. Yes. And multi-tier zoning. Is that also? Yeah, you know, it comes up, and then we have to go through my notes and let you know exactly where I pick it up. But you know, beside you is somebody who has extensive knowledge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Ask the panel. Yeah. So, so you said that that would be embedded in the land use bylaw, multi-tier mm -hmm. zoning. Is it currently embedded in the land use? No. Bylaw? So what? Like, take down below. We do. It's like we seek amenities and rezoning. Right? So we say, when you rezone, we'll take your amenities then, and then we'll zone you at a new level. What you can do in the Local Government Act, it's called, they call it density benefits for amenities, affordable housing, and special needs housing. Mm -hmm. So zoning bylaw may, I'm just going to, may establish different density rules for a zone. One generally applicable for the zone, and the other or others to apply if the applicable conditions are met. And so it may establish conditions that entitle owner to a higher density, and it may be, um, Relating to the conservation or provision of amenities, including the number, kind, and extent of amenities, conditions related to the provision of affordable and special needs housing, including the number, kind, and extent of the housing, and a condition that the owner enter into a housing agreement before a building permit is issued. So often these are like, we commonly, it's like small town downtowns may have a, a density bonus to say, okay, if you put the parking underground, you can have a higher FSR or something. That's a really common one in terms of, so it's just saying you can build a little bigger, but use something that we want you to do. Um, I did one in Kitimat when we had a work camp going that essentially said, okay, you get this many work camp beds, and then if you want more than that, you need to give us, it was like $500 a bed to go into an affordable housing fund. I was just looking at, like, Metro Vancouver says Richmond has one where essentially gives you extra um, floor area if you give them money per square foot or to a um, affordable housing fund. Hmm. Interesting. So in theory, yeah, you could do it and you would say, you just have it in, the, in say the SR2, you get, you know, up for this maximum, but, or if you provide a secondary suite inside the thing, then you get a mix or whatever. Of, of but you know, the key thing, thing is by, if you look at that graphic there, right? Maybe yeah. I just explain it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah. interesting. If you, if you don't understand it, it's not finished, okay? Because um, this was just updated after the last meeting. And I was kind of searching for it yesterday, and my computer fell in my pocket. <laughs> 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 Perfect. It's okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but you know, I can't really read it here, but this is what a large rural lot, right? You know, like, I think it's... Can you read it somewhere? It's the, I think this one is... Is it the 10? It's like the 10. I don't know if this is the 10 acre, this is the 5, whatever, right? But, uh, it, in general, this is RR1, this is rural, this is rural residential, 1, 2, whatever, right? And, um, yeah. But the, the, the point is this, really, that um, this is the lot, the next thing in line is just a setback that you have to be within. Um, this is the, um, this is the, I'm not sure if this correctly, this is the maximum floor space. For site coverage yeah. maybe, because it's often site coverage. No, no, the, the smaller one is the lot coverage, yeah, and that's the floor area. Okay. Or this floor is space. the floor area, right, and this yeah. is lot coverage. Yeah. So if you take this floor area, and go in, th on in three story building, mm -hmm. then I get a certain number of the maximum house size. Mm -hmm. For memory, it's 40,000 square feet here, right. maximum house size, it's 70,000 here, so mm -hmm. 10,000 here. Mm -hmm. So if you, go, if you go down through the numbers, this is the maximum size. One of these, you can only have one. You can have, you can have this, like one secondary suite, mm -hmm. or you can have uh, your detached secondary suite. So I detach it, right there it is. It's either this or this. That in the text I would have written, maybe you could have more, and it wouldn't really make any difference. It doesn't and still tell the room. Yeah. <laughs> if you tell me if I add, if I have a 40,000 square feet house here in three stories, right? Or, um, you know, or, and I have one little building here, right? Would it make a difference from a rural point of view if, the, for instance, there's a second little building here of 1,000 square feet? Or if there's one or two secondary suites. So from a rural point of view, it's well designed to send you. It will look completely rural. That people will see, yes, but there's more cars and more people going to ferry. But that is whatever you do with density, that the same argument argument will come up anywhere. Right? So this thing is that this gives you an idea. Now if you go here, this is um, this is one percent, this is two percent, I think, of the total square footage that's allowed. And then here, so then if you go through it, here's 4%, it goes here and here and here. And this is the actual snuff code village, where the lot size 
is smaller than the maximum that allowed to build. So this thing has expanded all the way till the actual area that you can build is larger than the mod size because the floor space ratio is more than one. Okay? And then, but even there, if you take that, if you compare that with um, you know, similar buildings in you know, urban environments, you can still have secondary speed in it. You can, you know, there's, still, there's no reason why you couldn't still perform the same. But here people think it's normal because everything has to happen in, in some code, right? If you read the, the Bibles. Um, but well, well, here, or somewhere in here, there may be opposition, you know? Um, so if you go, th these are the, um, the uh, settlement, I think, ones, like the, yeah. and then you can see how, again, this is the site, the next size that you can build. Um, you, you can have one of these. And then here you can see how it tightens up. But still, if you go through all the numbers, I think here is something like it's 14% of the floor space, and here it's something between like 1 and 2%. Mm -hmm. But if like, this graphic, if it's worked out better, what I thought actually would be better to do is to, um, the, the green is, is, is the D text, the, the blue is the app text mm -hmm. uh, secondary suite. And then I thought, well, if you add it, it's probably better to do it in the web. When you add this, the people pick up. And what about add these? Would it be so terrible? But what it does is just a graphic, and then this could also be drawn. Like if we would have time in the office, I could ask someone to do that. We could easily put it in sketch up. <laughs> and then do a little. <laughs> yeah. More, yeah, I'd really like to take, take one of these, say from this, and maybe one of them here, one of them here, and just do it like graphically, actually draw the whole house, like, you know, keep the house, and then, and then make people say, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so Fritz, if we're sort of boiling this down to the takeaways from what you've presented here, what are they? I mean, is it that we have large lots with, with much greater capacity for well, providing homes? Is it... Uh, well, you know, if you look at the if you look at the official community plan, mm -hmm. it, it actually took me back 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then you think, well, what is it? It is that mindset that somehow there is an expectation that all development that's required, all the issues that Bowen Island has can be resolved in the snuck over area. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really ingrained to the OCP. Yes, it is. You know, it uses reallocation of density, mm -hmm. but it has a cap on the on, on the on the total, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't know if it's actually actively used or if it's ignored. Like, I kind of wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I I would say in short, we have a track roughly of where, like, how much growth has been approved since like the 2010 OCP, and in part we're we're significantly below because the 96 OCP that the numbers are based on had Cape Verde Curtis at. 220 mm -hmm. lots or whatever it was, and it was developed at 60. So there's like a shortfall. Yeah, but the, the, way, it's, a, the way it's yeah. written is that you actively have to move uh, OCP density from from the rural areas into the... the so I would say, yeah. I mean, there's different Which policies. So there's the policy that says, we're not gonna increase, and there's policy that says, talking about reallocating. Yeah. But council can amend, like the schedule C and amend where density is without having to amend principle no additional lots as long as we're simple in that number. But, but, but it still means is that the the current OCP it's in the current OCP and even that level that maximum number of units or of dwellings in my mind is a totally you can throw it out because it's not based on anything that has any rationale in it. The way it works is like this. They um, what is it? I have I wrote it down somewhere here but Danielle knows it too. It is um, when the 1996 OCP was done, we're talking about this now, 20, more than 20 years ago, um, there were 4,000 people approximately on the island. Then they calculated how many new single family lots could be created under the OCP. So then they came up with the number of 1,125 or 27 uh, additional single family lots that could be that could have households on it. This was in okay? 1996. In 1996, yeah, so that is still the standard. And then, the, uh, and then they said there would be 2.4 people per, per household. 
Then you take 1125 times 2.4, you get about 3,000, and that static caps up 7,000 people. Now, what is the freaking rationale in that in today's, in today's environment? It they, is. Well, I, I remember <laughs> that time, and they were talking a lot about water resources and yeah. septic. There was this idea out there that we didn't have the water on the island for more than, but I remember 7,000 being, somebody saying it was a cap. I remember a workshop specifically for the island yes. and water. Fine, but then, then, then say we have two restraints and they're called water and sewage. Don't say the number is 1125, which was somehow envisioned by an OCP, which may not be sure. realistic at all, because maybe there wasn't enough water and sewage for that. You just don't know. Okay. It's just, it is an artificial is that a, is that number. Is that definitely an, art, uh, an unknowable then? How much, how many people can be supported by well, the amount of water we You know, it has something like, 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 like yesterday, I was in a meeting, and um, the, the whole area here comes back to the sewage treatment facility. Mm -hmm. Now, there's technology out of there that maybe costs more or less money, and it can provide more or less sewage disposal, right? And then, they, and then with, uh, with, with water, uh, water is available depending on how much money you spend on it. Yeah. The whole Metro Vancouver area does not have water without reservoirs. The reservoirs keep all of the lower mainland running. If you put in a tap in West Vancouver or Vancouver, that's not local. That comes from the mountains, okay. way back. So with the research that you have done, and the understanding that you have with you and Daniel, would you say that there is a cap on the population according to water? Or you know, I would say that that is something that is incremental. The idea that, that there is a number, that I think is incorrect. But it would be about more and more after if there will be experts who can advise me, right? But what, I, what I'm saying is there are all kinds of things embedded in the OCP that come from somewhere that actually hinder development sure. and they should be addressed. If you want to keep a number in it, fine, just call the number. Don't try to give it the right no. <laughs> now. But, but I am thinking we should bear this in mind. The way, one of the things that Metro Vancouver spends a lot of um, time and effort on is water conservation mm -hmm. processes. So um, they build into their projections um, expectations of if we're able to accomplish X amount of water conservation, it will have this impact okay. on our, our water resources. So it makes it as, as Fritz is saying, it makes it extremely difficult because really if you affect people's consumption behavior, then all of a sudden you have a lot more capacity yes. to serve yeah. more people. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I've like done is I've put a list up, sorry to interrupt yeah. Danielle, I've put a list up, so OCP, LUV, which is land use bylaw, and then at the end we'll talk about using the tools. But I think that's like, let's just write these ideas yeah. down so that, but you know, it, and not that that's the focus of today, but it is Yeah, maybe what I should do is just more kind of run through it. Sure, and just, yeah, let's do just that. Give then I have a request. Yeah. Is it possible to photocopy what you're going to read? Uh, yeah, just well, because it can be email, just write on the, it's, it's on, on the steps. Oh, I've got my computer there. Computer, and it's on my computer, and you can forward to everybody, right? Do you want I think I, oh, I thought I saw, I can print them if you want to make notes. That would be great. Sorry, I'm yeah. just yeah. sitting there, yeah. um, there, yeah. It yeah. would be helpful yeah. for me to track what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But your, your elaboration there, um, Fritz, of sort of what the takeaways are supposed to be from here and then going to the OCP and that, that number, yeah. that's very helpful. And I've often had you know, your, your sense of the, the strong focus on Snow Cove. It drives me bonkers, the extent to which we have fetishized that yes. one block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and achieve nothing in doing that. Yes. It, yes. Well, I wouldn't say nothing. That, that's too harsh. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I completely but, agree. <coughs> But I often, and, and then the other part of your, your comment was, you know, where has the development occurred um, since 1996? Mm -hmm. And I mean, more recently, um, if you look at Grafton, that's not Snow Cove. Mm -hmm. But it's the, the other piece that is in the OCP has to do with the relationship with transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're on a bus route, mm -hmm. that makes certain kinds of developments yeah. much more attractive. Yeah, but even, even that, you're saying it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, here. There is a, there is in the, in the OCP, mm -hmm. it says there cannot be, what do we call it? Um, what's the name of it? Um, 
like linear, we call it like, um, there's not a Dutch word for it, lintbebouwing, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for their strip development. Strip, yeah, like oh, a yeah. Yeah. strip. And then, if, and then, then I think, well, okay, but if you have a bus route, the bus can stop anywhere. Yeah. Right, so you can either say from while well, you encourage certain things along the bus route, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean it has to become ugly or so, you know, it can just be nice. There, you can like, again use your um, two tier zoning uh, mm -hmm. encouragement because you actually make it a smaller house size mm -hmm. and you allow more mm -hmm. to be added if you put in maybe secondary suites. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't have one secondary suite, they have two, mm -hmm. you know, but the um, but it's in it isn't OCP. Then you can also determine along the bus route, maybe the little places where you don't mind to have a little cluster of housing. Mm -hmm. Like maybe a woman says, well, you know what, that's a really good area. You know, and not everybody has to walk to the ferry. Not everybody does that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe people say, well, feel fine, I don't want to be in the, in the village. Mm -hmm. So, but it, this is the first thing you said, it's an OCP. There's the one thing that actually discourages that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But so the, but then, Sorry, say that again. What discourages it? Well, the the the, the, the actually I can't find it here instantly, but it's actually in here somewhere. But you said in the OCP, <laughs> there's something in the OCP that yes. discourages the concentration and it's not that, it's yeah. snow cold. That is okay. It all right. Overarching, he says that all density should be focused in snow cold. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which is erroneous thinking. Okay, I'll give you this point. For instance, here, like then I wrote down the OCP for housing is based on three principles. Here they are, one, two, three. We come straight out of the OCP, right? Principle one, new development should primarily take place within or adjacent to areas of existing acti activity. The policy to reallocate existing OCP density to the Snuggrove area is based on the, uh, oh no, the, okay. the, the only thing in the, the principle is new development should primarily take place within or adjacent to areas of existing activity. Then I wrote, the policy to reallocate existing OCP density to the Snuggrove area is based on the assumption that all housing issues can be resolved by densifying the Snuggrove general area. Mm -hmm. For the last 20 years or so, this has been ineffective. True, right? Yeah. Then principle two, the OCP says adjustments to the location, size and density of existing lots is encouraged as a way to shift towards a more sustainable settlement pattern. I warn you when you get this, I have stomach mistakes in this, okay? Yes. <laughs> I read it without the stomach mistakes. It's a line of the printer, but it's stomach. <laughs> and then, okay, so I read it again. Adjustment to the location, size, and density of existing lots is encouraged as a way to shift towards a more sustainable settlement pattern. This principle focuses on reducing density on most of Bowen Island and densifying the snug of general area. For the last 20 years or so, this has been ineffective. That's what I said. Principle three, notwithstanding the potential to adjust the distribution and location of dwelling units on the island, the overall number of primary dwelling units anticipated in the 1996 OCP will remain the same. Then I wrote, this principle is based on the belief that the maximum number of 1,227 new single-family lots to, that, that are permitted by the 1996 OCP and the resulting theoretical Bowen Island population of 7,000 residents with 2.4 people per dwelling provides the cap for all forms of housing development. For the last 20 years or so, this has been ineffective and should be deleted. So then, if you start to read what the OCP says about housing, and it starts with three principles, mm -hmm. and none of them seem to be what people think currently. Mm -hmm. There has to be a huge mindset in how people think the last 20 years. 20 years ago, you couldn't do anything. The, 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 the main sport in, on Bowen Island was to be Resisting. against everything. Yeah. And now people are far more positive, they have completely different expectations. So that if you review the OCP, you have to go back. And when I said, when I read this, I said, oh shit, some of this is here because yes, it was written 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is out of fear, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. you know? and, it, and a good OCP is not based on limiting, a good OCP is based on facilitating what you want to do. Yes. And to do that, you have to set your principles. Yes, and this are, these are the three yes. principles. And I think, from, you know, if it starts at that, that's not a good sign. Can, can I ask, uh, as 
slightly tangential. Well, I'll ask. We've got three hours. Like we're yeah, we're we're allowed to go off on tangents. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, the question is for Daniel. Um, we have in the uh, advisory planning commission a discussion going on right now of conservation mm -hmm. development. Yeah. Um, which I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are with these parallel mm -hmm. yeah. conversations going on because part of the concern of the, the conservation development uh, work has to do with not further fragmenting large areas of yeah. um, land. So when I look at the first, second, and third um, elements of the, the drawings out there, I'm trying to figure out what yeah. the connection is. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, I see the conservation development stuff as, like, almost to some extent, giving definition to things such as that second principle that says adjustments to location, size, and density of existing lots. And so it's looking at, like, what, you know, when a rezoning comes forward, it's like a guide for council to say, this is what we look for in that rezoning, saying that, like, if 10 acre lots already exist, it's like either that people could come to rezone, I guess, to get more lots out of them and then we would look to cluster it and conserve parts of it and keep with sort of the, the principles of cluster development in the OCP. So if, if you were to, um, like I'm, I'm looking yeah. at the, the first one yeah. and I'm thinking, okay, if you put a conservation development lens on that, you just take this detached so that you pop it up closer yeah. and you keep eight acres clear. Yeah. But you know, it's yeah, actually, but there's a, in the existing OCP, there is also something about Cape Port Curves, mm -hmm. right? It's actually really interesting because it says, um, okay, I, this is what I wrote down, okay? This is more like a summary. The current OCP specifically enables, okay, I have to go on that, sorry. Um, this has something to do with amenity zone, right? And then I say the current OCP specifically enables this concept for the existing sub for the existing subdivided 10 acre lots of Cape Orchard Curtis. And then I give, it's in there. It says from, although the, it, it's written like this, although uh, uh, Cape Orchard Curtis has been subdivided in 10 acre lots, council or the community uh, still encourages further to, uh, to reach more uh, community objectives on Cape Orchard Curtis. So the current OCP specifically enables this concept to, to uh, to be used for the existing subdivided 10 acre lots of Cape Orchard Curves. Then I give an example. For example, a 10 acre lot can be divided into one 2 acre lot for the principal residence, plus maybe uh, eight 1 quarter acre lots, uh, acre lots for, and, and maybe with secondary suites. So the, the, but if you do that, then you can still have more than 50% of the land that you maybe have six out of the 10 acres that can be protected as environmentally sensitive areas. So now, as a council, you actually use a tool. So is it then conservation development? Yes, it is. Because it's amenity zoning, or called two-tier zoning, you know, um, that allows people to do this if they meet your conservation objectives. Instead of just not doing anything, you actually take, take control. And then if there's, a, if there's a, an overall uh, concept of how Cape Port Securities can develop further, incrementally, bit by bit, you know, it's maybe all the lots that haven't been sold yet, fine. Or it's maybe, uh, I, would, I would say you would, you would actually um, enable every 10 acre lot to, to do something. Because first of all, it's, it's a start. Uh, let give me an example. If you have a 10 acre lot, and let's say it happens to be a waterfront and it's not developed yet, and you think, you well, know, I don't need that whole lot for myself, right? And you say, I don't mind to give up, um, uh, you know, part of the waterfront. And you, and you can build two or three houses clustered close to the waterfront, right? Now, then you can probably ask for, 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 for nine acres to be, uh, to be made, made public because there's three houses, they probably triple the value or they double at least the value of the lot, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a huge tool. And so the, the idea is that um, uh, conservation development, in my mind, actually, if you use these tools, 
they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not one against the other. It yeah. absolutely is. Yeah. And that all would be within the constraints of water and septic and yeah. community yeah. will. Daniel yeah. says so Put one other one in there. We're, we're talking specifically on housing, but another land use that is important for where we might be in the future is some form of agricultural use. Yes. Mm -hmm. And future Absolutely. agriculture yeah. is going to be higher intensive with greenhouse. Absolutely. It's going to need worker accommodation there. And it's probably going to need Airbnb tourism rental income yes. to make the whole economic package work on that 10 acre lot. So, so they are, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a special case we ought to advise <coughs> and put in as uh, in this so it's making all the farms legal it's making um there's um, another couple of latest things i mean it's we ought to be encouraging growing more food on the island instead of bringing it in from yeah. miles away it's just dying. yeah so if that is if that is clearly defined you know as yeah. a reason to put as an amenity or as a two-tier system right yes. the implementation of it can be preservation, it can be architecture, it can be park space, it can be anything. Right? But it is, that's significant worker accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it can be. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and exactly the idea that everybody has to live here, the moment you say, for, well, if there are these you know, small kind of uh, agricultural enterprises and people need to be able to live close by, well, guess what? There you go. <laughs> Less transport than you. Yeah. Well, I've often heard in conversation with community members just the whole notion of pocket neighborhoods and why can't there be you know, small business areas outside of the cold yeah. you know, that would mean that they would not be traveling mm -hmm. from one end of the island to get a yeah. bit of milk. It has to be at a coffee yeah. shop. Well, kind yeah. of does actually with the ready mm. kitchen. Yeah. Not functioning. Oh, Shortage of staff who won't be open. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I, don't, I agree with those. And I do have, if we get to it, I have a couple of examples um, of Gibsons and Maple Ridge who develop zone, specific zones for like cluster developments on previously single family lots. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, just in terms of process for this work you're doing. Um, it is is. Is the objective for you right now to give us all the information so then we can make a decision about our, our recommendation? Do you, or would it be relevant if we were to say, in your opinion, which which OCP policies are irrelevant, and then you tell us that, and then we decide? Because I don't think I can hold everything well. in my head. Okay, but something has to, at a certain point, it has to go to council, right? Yes, of course. So um, We don't make decisions, but we can make recommendations. Yeah, so there, there's, there, there has to be a clear summary to, there has, there has to be a few different documents. One of them is to make council <coughs> aware of what they could do, mm -hmm. right? And that is more to get their interest. Yeah. And an example can, um, can, can be very effective because people think, really? You know what I mean? Is that true? And they say, well, yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then you can have a summary of the, the, the like, what are the the main things that would need to be addressed. And then you can be either systematic and say, well, in theory, you should start with the principles and build the whole OCP back up again, which in a way you should do. Um, but then. Um, and then it, almost as an attachment, you can say, from, okay, these are, the, are items that are embedded in the OCP and probably should be addressed. But like you can't make it one big document because I think you simply lose people. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, but what I wanted to do is just, just maybe just let, let me read through this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the OCP, that is page two at the top, it kind of I'll give some examples. So then, the concept of density reallocation should be abandoned as it implies that landowners are entitled to their OCP density, which they are not. Owners are only entitled, and that's still questionable by the way, owners are only, I would say, somewhat entitled to actual zoning density of the land use bio. An OCP is required to be updated every five to ten years to reflect changing community objectives, which already implies that it is a changing thing, it's not something you can possibly own. 
So reallocation OCP density is ineffective and takes effective zoning tools to implement community objectives away from council. I'm absolutely sure about that because um, uh, uh, density reallocation only works if the density has a value, right? It becomes a commodity, a trade, a trading, and then you cannot create. Uh, uh, the council cannot create density because it affects that value. You know what I mean? Like it is a bit like it is a bit like money. You know, like if you have, if there's a limited amount of money, the money has value. If you keep printing it, it doesn't have value. Right? So if you, if you create more density, if, if council creates more density, which you should be able to do, because that's, the, that's, that's how you implement uh, community objectives. Um, but if you give that away, because now it has to be transferred, right? which means that suddenly everything stops. Now, my kind of feeling is that, that this is, since most people don't really read the OCP before they go to bed, right? um, that it is somewhat ignored. It's in here, but it's somewhat ignored. But what you have to watch is that if you have some great ideas, and if um, if people object to it, and it's and the OCP tells you that you cannot do these things, or you should not do these things, right? I mean, but in the, the, the first page of every OCP it says that council doesn't have to implement the OCP, but they cannot do anything that contradicts the OCP, because then they have to change the OCP. So if you don't change the OCP every once in a while, that thing becomes more and more something that actually hinders you from doing what you want to do, right? So, but the... Um, yeah. So just a quick question for Daniel. Mm -hmm. The um, density reallocation um, at this point really has not been used as a tool. No. Has it ever been used as I, a tool? No. No. But it's but but it's an example. That it's there, and but it's, it's also based. The same speak. thing. It also uses the seven thousand. It's still yeah. based on these principles. Yeah. So, this is sound stupid. How did it get embedded in the OCP in the first place? Why did people think it was a good idea back in ninety six or? 2010, when, whenever it made its way in there. The, the density transfer, yeah. or whatever it's called. Yeah. Why did you uh, think it was a density reallocation? Reallocation. Yeah. Well, it's used elsewhere, right? And why? In large it, cities, yeah. generally, right? So is it just a misapplication of an urban tool to a rural environment? Uh, no, I think it was done because at that time people really thought that um, there should not be more density on Bowman okay. except the Snuckoff area. Okay. And so, like, although it is written, it's not really written that it. You, you can look at it from both sides. This is the idea that two ob two objectives are two directly linked. Mm -hmm. So one of them is to keep the island rural. The other one is uh, providing more affordable housing, mm -hmm. you know, or smaller forms of housing. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't link those two because one is in the way of the other. Like the idea that people would actually transfer or reallocate density is just is, is never going to happen, because also they say a unit, a unit of density in the rural area is the same as a unit of density in the co. Mm -hmm. This one is 500 square feet. This one is up to 40,000 square feet, mm -hmm. or it's big, big, small, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make any sense. But, but, but the only thing what I'm saying is that these are just examples, and if you read through it, there is more and more. Um, Anyway, so the, the one thing I picked up too, for instance, in the Snug Cove area, is that if we want to be effective in the Snug Cove area, the OCP still encourages the creation of single family lots. It's in there. I would say to stick it out because, like, it cannot possibly be an effective way to get more. But, you know, even the small little lots that go in there at along Miller, if, the, if you would take that piece of land, and allow something like the pub, like a, like a multi-use like multi kind of larger building, you are far more effective. There's just no comparison, right? Also from a cost point of view, each of these houses costs far more to build them. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it, it's cute, maybe. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, I've always struggled a bit with the whole unit count as a measure of density. And I mean, I know it's just one way we do it, but 
really, should it be floor space, should it be number of bedrooms, people housed, all that kind of stuff, because like you say, comparing a studio apartment above the pub or the distillery to a 3,000, 10,000 square foot house, mm -hmm. they're each one dwelling unit, and like, there's just, they're not comparable at all, right? So, I don't know, I guess that's kind of an odd point, but... Yeah. yeah. This is just like only touching on what's on the OCP. Yeah. I mean, maybe this is enough for now about OCP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, and, but back to yours, I'm, I'm also struggling a little bit with like how do we, because it's just so big, mm -hmm. right? What the conversation mm -hmm. we're having today is so big. So um, I think if we can pull out a few things, mm -hmm. you know, a few of those key points, or say, look, these are the three main housing principles in the OCP, we think all three need to be revisited and rethought. If that's kind of one statement, mm -hmm. I think that's a useful thing to come out of today. And then as we dig into the land use bylaw, same thing, like let's let's figure out as we go, is it pulling out a few, is it going line by line, which could be free. So, you know, so I think it's pretty open what we can get out of today and wrap our heads around, because it's a, it's a big thing, yeah. Is there some measure of value of having or what community do you want to create? Mm. If that's the, the vision of what Bowen's going to be, these changes have to appear in the uh, OCP, they have to appear in LUB, because we're not creating, we, yeah. in my opinion, we have not yeah, created yeah, that community which is true. in our mind. Yeah. Everything is true. If you formulate what the mandate of the, of the committee is, right? Yeah. And then what we're supposed to achieve. And then you say from the... What, when starting to review the OCP, to which degree it facilitates to implement those objectives, we find that the first three principles, mm -hmm. and principles are important, right? Because everything else you can follow mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, need to be reviewed yeah. or need to be addressed. I and if, if that's the only thing we would say, and then, and then if, 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 if the council would want to have some examples, maybe we give it next time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But yeah, mine relates to the principles idea. Yeah. It seems to me that you're saying that the principles that the OCP is based on are no longer relevant to our concept now of the island that we are, of what we need. Yeah. So it seems to me that what we need to do is develop new principles. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, I think I'm, I'm just rephrasing what you yeah, just no, said. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's good. That's no, understanding it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and until we do that, everything else is just stabbing in the dark because everything has to relate back to the principles. Yes. Um, and so the principles are based on what I, in what way has our concept of what's responsible environmentally, population, water, need for, for rents, etc. Yeah. What's changed between 20 years ago and now? And there's huge changes. Mostly up here for people. Yes, it is. And <laughs> I need to articulate that. And I just want to, sorry, I have to run to the bathroom, but I wonder if one of the things, maybe we should pause the conversation and write down what is the housing that we as this committee yeah. feel the community needs? Because yes. I think what we're all dancing around is saying this is, mm -hmm. in the past 20 years, this hasn't got us what we think we need now. Yeah. Maybe it's, we should just blame the list. I'd what is the housing? Like, for example, worker housing or people yes. earning this much or something along those lines. Maybe if we explicitly state those yeah. and then we look at all of these things through that. I don't know what yes, do. yes, I, yes. I put that building a house limit, house size limit. Yeah. To, so so I and maybe do you want, should, we, should it be posted? Yeah, yeah, please. When we do yeah. post it and we can all just. Um, and I need to go get Lady. She's in the car. Okay, so maybe just bring hand them. them. Does that make that. sense? Yes. Okay, so let's do that and brainstorm that to Matt. Do you want to? No, yes, 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 Spitting out ideas is fine with me, but the um, I, I give an example. Um, if you think about all the neighborhoods, or <coughs> called neighborhood areas, mm -hmm. and if you would say from, what if you would ask a neighborhood what they feel comfortable with, instead of creating a list of what you think they should have? You see what I mean? <laughs> I do, except that I think that that's what this committee because. If you ask every neighbourhood what they think, they, I, I think it gets too, I 
I, mean, I, I like the democracy of that for the other, that. that the community chooses. Asking the whole community what they want. No, I would say that, that we right. actually don't even, if, we don't even have to do it like that. But if you would first look at the island at a map, yeah. and you yeah. picture that you live in a specific neighborhood, and what would the neighborhood need? And what would that neighborhood feel comfortable with? Mm. Instead of just being too general, because that is almost like, something has to work for the whole island, that already means that you have 75% of the people against you. But if you, if, you, if you distinguish between neighborhood areas and then try to figure out what may be needed there. Like if you take, okay, for example, if you take the Snakov area, you probably have a different list than if you take Hood Point. And you probably get a different list than if you think about Cape Roger Girls. And if you do that specifically, if we write down the different areas, and what what may, what may be required in those areas, and then use that as the base for it, what we want to do. Because then it is, like, I always find it dangerous if it becomes too, like, um, Robin, when you were just stepping out for a bit, what I said, I said the three letter word, which was but, right? Uh, and then because I, I felt, not a four letter but, but, so that's what I, but I, um, but what I felt is that if we all start spitting out ideas, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't necessarily have to go further than this room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, from, by reading these documents, I felt that if you imagine that you are in one specific neighborhood, so yeah. if we say, um, if you distinguish between the neighborhoods, now picture yourself in the cove, you live there, or you work there, or you are living in Hood Point mm -hmm. and taking extremes of purpose, yeah. or in Cape Portia Curtis, mm -hmm. or maybe something in between, mm -hmm. somewhere on Adams Rock for self, right? Like on the trunk rock, whatever. And then you write those down, and then you, st then you start to think of what may those neighborhoods need, mm -hmm. right? Then what I like about it, it's not about what we think, it is more like what would they need? And then if you go to them, and it's, it's just a different approach, and then yeah. somehow, you make people aware that they don't have to be afraid because fear comes from a lot of things, a lot of bylaws. If you look at bylaws, as an architect, the most frustrating thing are bylaws because mm -hmm. it tells you everything you're not allowed to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but so key about it, I mean, it, it sounds like it's so key about it. Every day that a municipal council creates bylaws, they always have a purpose. They have no idea of everything that they restrict. And as architects, we are constantly, 99% of the time, restricted. Mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting point, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about two things. Um, one was this spot zoning that was done in uh, Cakes Hill to enable yeah. the building yeah. of those duplexes. Yeah. Um, uh, Wolfgang's trial duplexes. Um, the, the neighborhood response there was definitely mixed. Yeah. You know, there were some people who bought into a single family home neighborhood, even though many of those houses have um, secondary suites built into them. Yeah. Um, but there, there was you know, the, the form of the duplex offended some of the neighbors initially. I haven't heard anything further um, since they, they were built. The other thing is I'm thinking about is the housing assessment work, right? The housing assessment work that is coming up through the survey that will be on behalf of the well funded by the province on behalf right. of us. Yep, the land uh, housing needs assessment. Yeah. And um, um, I mean, we have identified neighborhoods on Bowen Island for the purposes of a whole bunch of things, including the transportation plan, so on, for emergency planning. So there are defined existing neighborhoods. I'm wondering if, because we've got some latitude with the housing assessment, if some questions related to the point that you're making could be included. You know, which neighborhood are, are you in? And then some sort of careful question that was going to um, ask about the tolerance or the interest in different housing forms in yeah. those neighborhoods. I like how you phrase it. What does your neighborhood need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, because might be that Hood Point or Hood Cape Roger, I'm just picking them out, doesn't, you know, yeah. they say, well, we don't really need townhouses and we don't really need apartment buildings. But you know what? 
some little cluster developments for people downsizing would be really good for our neighborhood, exactly. right? And then you might get somebody in some other neighborhood exactly. who says, oh no, we'd love to have, to, like maybe Tungstall Bay, like I have no idea. They might say, we'd love to have family townhousing. We'd love to have yeah. some apartment down by the water, like whatever it is, right? Like we'd love to have more people in our neighborhood and at our beach club or whatever it is. So um, I really like that approach of actually maybe, maybe, and it's, I don't know exactly if it can work with the consultant, whoever does it, but yeah, maybe it's throwing out this idea of the different housing types or whatever we think. And then you actually ask those neighborhoods and say, what do you think yours needs? Because this came up in one of our discussions. I love the idea that, you know, maybe we aim for each neighborhood or each neighborhood that wants it. Mm -hmm has, and again, it's a test or a pilot, has a little bit of cluster, yeah. downsize type, you know, development, because yeah. that's a real struggle against, for people. What you're up yeah. against is yeah. fear. It's yeah. always fear. Mm. And so the, the, you know, like, I said it earlier, but I wrote down another effective method to carefully introduce new forms of development to a neighborhood area is spot zoning, used by the city of North Vancouver. Like a pilot project, it permits a neighborhood to test a specific form of development. Mm -hmm. And then in each development, even if you have a neighborhood, the neighborhood may have some spots where people say, oh yeah, I don't mind if you test that. And then, so if the council, the difference is between major decisions and small decisions. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to make a small decision. Mm -hmm. And if that small decision is well received, then guess what, you do it again. Yeah. Right? And then you, you, you never really have to, to allow a whole neighborhood to do the same at the same time because that's when you run into opposition. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, that principle of it's a pilot yeah. and it's a test and we'll see if it works. So it doesn't suddenly come out, develop a jump site and can do it across you know, it, the whole it, it way. Doesn't, it, doesn't, um, it even doesn't set a precedent. Yeah. Because yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the word I'm trying to find. Yeah. It yeah. also doesn't trigger people's fear. Yeah. 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 Uh, so then the question I'll take then, that I've heard fear a lot, loves the other side of that. How do we put something in our paperwork that emphasizes the love of where we want to be rather than the fear of losing what used to be here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I, I mean, I think yeah. you, you would facilitate that by, again, by allowing this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, if you look at the North Shore news, right, there will be every week, there will be, um, uh, rezoning applications for small single family, for smaller lots in the district in the in the city of North Vancouver, mm -hmm. right? It is like, and after a while, people don't even read it anymore because oh, it's another one, right? So it becomes something that one time goes through a little bit more thorough process. Then, if there is no resistance, guess what? The second one is much easier. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you know, it, and then you, you, at a certain point, you may even add it to the zoning schedule for the whole neighborhood but I wouldn't do that too soon mm -hmm. because you have actually the luxury to permit it but because they do that consistently as spot zoning it can never set a precedent because spot zoning is the way they work you see what I mean but yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a deliberate choice, or did it just end up being I don't know if it just historically grew like that, and if you ask the city of North Vancouver, is it totally effective, they probably have some pros and cons, mm -hmm. because it may take more time, you know what I mean, or it may uh, so need more the staff resources, but I would say for Bowen to be more caring and to be more involved in people's, how it affects Mm -hmm. affects people, mm -hmm. I would think it's, it's, it's a great idea. Also because it's only one thing in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. right, and people can talk about it, mm -hmm. and it's not just kind of thrown onto them, um, that in my mind makes a difference. Yeah, you know? it sounds great. In fact, I'm not really correct that this, this is the city you're talking about. There's something like 60% renter. Yes, very high percentage very high. of renters, yeah. And a different mindset in the district, yeah. right? Yeah. I've forgotten what's our percentage of renters. 20%? 18. 18. Wow. And it's, it's been at for at least 21 years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, where to next? Is that, do we feel like we kind of, I know that was very roundabout, that wasn't very specific, but. Do we want to move along to maybe discussing municipal tools? Yeah. I think it'd be good to have, because we already talked about a couple. Yeah. So maybe we list some of those out, and then we can move into the land use bylaw. 
sure. specific question. Um, I mean, and you're on a document. There's some, there's some good PDFs that are out there, but some of it is it's sort of the difference between municipal tools that enable site-specific projects and municipal tools that are looking at like, municipality-wide. So you see things listed like you know providing land for affordable housing projects, providing funding for affordable housing projects, right? Which are very much like this is to help this one project, like a birch project, to go ahead. I don't know if that's necessarily what we're talking about at this meeting, as opposed to like what's a you know what helps the entire island, what's a bigger scale piece, mm -hmm. um, and then those are some of the things that Fritz has talked about. So you see density bonusing quite often, um, community amenity contributions, things we have like affordable housing policies. So you can have inclusionary zoning, it's called, which is where so if you think of normally zoning is exclusionary, it says you can't do anything except you can do these things. Mm -hmm. Inclusionary zoning would say okay, you have to do certain things. So if you build units, you have to provide one unit of affordable housing for every however many units of market housing. And those tend to be, say, not as successful. They tend to be heavily advocated and not as successful because sometimes maybe the, like the finances don't work. Yeah, you tell people, you know, every third unit has to be affordable. Well, then probably don't be built anything. Mm -hmm. how, how, how effective it would be then. Um, I mean, the other tools I had were just more is sort of it's, it's zoning as a tool is sort of the, the tool and then pieces people look at you know if we increase density what happens if we reduce parking if we reduce setbacks if we yeah and all of those sort of tools are there that are sort of built into the zoning as a tool um, yeah I don't know how else to, to add to that I mean some of it comes to like like if the city of North Van has lots of little rezonings it's like some of that is the policy work beforehand so it says like we've talked about in terms of pocket neighborhoods or um, you know it's like having a policy that says okay you know we'll consider rezoning applications if you follow these steps and it's having something that has buy-in by council by neighborhoods that like okay we're okay with it in pocket neighborhoods if you follow these steps and then if something comes to a rezoning then we say okay that's great you ticked all your boxes you're good to you know you should have a smooth rezoning because people some sort of certainty to say okay and then it's but then almost the repetition builds certainty too. So if you know the city of North Van, if they know that okay, if you're rezoning to be a townhouse and it meets all these boxes that everybody else has met, you're probably going to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Give well, certainty as opposed to like the first person has to kind of test the waters and yeah. mm -hmm. figure well, out. I'm not sure. Call that thing. I'm sorry, I missed the beat. Yeah, I mean those are so more. I guess just policy or guiding guiding documents. Because that's yeah. what we talked about. Like, is it possible for council municipality yeah. to create some kind of guiding thing to say, hey? This spot, we'd really like to see this, and instead of like proactively rezoning, which yeah. is an example yeah. on that yeah. whatever what area one wants you, it was a proactive to sell it. Mm -hmm. But is it possible to say like I'm thinking? Let's call this example. Um, if we agree that we need industrial space or job yeah. zoning space, yeah. or whatever, we say okay, we think the right area is here, right on yeah. the island, and we kind of draw a bubble. And then you say, we would like to see, you know, here's the principles, the guiding principles of what we would like to see, and if you want to approach us and go yeah. through a few, you know, preliminary cost-effective <coughs> steps, mm -hmm. gain some certainty. This is jumping into that process side of the internet, and yeah. I think yeah. we're all over the place in this meeting, is great. Uh, that's, I think, would be great. So what could we call that as, so, a, as a, like a... Yeah. I mean, to some extent, that's what the OCP is, Yeah. right? So if council said, we think that this area should be light industrial, that's what the OCP would designate that as light industrial. Right. And so then you'd say any future rezoning is going to rezone it to be light industrial. And you put light industrial yeah. principles and it's our you know policies that would say light industrial. Actually is. Is. Okay. Is, is what, what you just said, right? Yeah. Can't we just have policies, right? Yeah. But then uh, Danielle says, yes, but the OCP really is the policy. Yeah. Right? So if you create a policy that isn't consistent with the OCP, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Because you're not supposed to. Yeah. You cannot do anything that contradicts the OCP. Hmm. But then so then you can say this is the policies that we should have, which you started with earlier, right? Yeah. Like, what do we actually want to do? Yeah. So if you don't worry about the OCB for a while, because we discussed that it's not perfect, and if we have more focus on what it should be, right? Because we shouldn't be limited now by the OCP. Then maybe don't call them. If, um, if you would have policies, what would they be? And then would you change the OCP to mm -hmm. based on these policies, right? If you have that in, in your in your mind, then I think you're fine with doing that, mm -hmm. right? But you can't expect the policies to override OCP. No, no, absolutely. 
That's the, uh, it, it sounds to me, and I, I agree with everything you're saying, but it sounds to me like we're looking at putting practices into place which potentially could override the OCP. And it doesn't, there has to be some sort of... The OCP is revised. On an ongoing oh, basis, ongoing basis. It's just not in terms of these particular principles. Okay, so it's looking at another revision. It's due one soon. It's due one soon. Yeah. But so I mean, council, council, council can amend the OCP. Like the OCP is supposed okay. to be. Is it? It's not. Well, I mean, you know, in terms of it is constitution, but in terms of a living document, it's meant to be a vision for the community, right? And so the vision, yeah, like, it, it's perfectly fine to say, okay. you know, now we're we can we're gonna change it. We're adjusting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And council can do that. It can, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because I mean, I, I I disagree with the idea. We just go, let it go because so it's a great monitoring oh, yeah, no. tool. Yeah. I mean, what Daniel says is is true. Yes, you can change an OCP, right? And some zoning rezonings will say it includes an OCP amendment, but it's almost that you you acknowledge that your OCP is not in good shape, right? And then the, it's almost like you make an exception. Okay. And our OCP is actually not really, it's too detailed. It's mm -hmm. almost a bit like a zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. So then, and it always gives kind of an exception. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm just going to, because I want to capture, and I think we've yeah. talked about before, is if there's some way that we can give pre application yeah. rezoning certainty, like is there a way that for things that yeah. council and the community need and want, is there a way to work proactively, whether it's expressions of interest or whether it's something else? We don't know the answer today, and we don't have to, but I think that's what we say is, yeah, perfect. this is what staff <laughs> should be looking at, is ways to make the rezoning process easier to create the stuff, the housing, the whatever space and, and buildings and that we as a community think we need, which is housing and work job space and whatever. So anyways, I think that's a, well, it can be worded better, but I think that captures what yeah, we've been talking yeah. about. Okay. I just want to say something about the word density. Um, you have to be very careful with that word. Um, yeah. that's, a, that's a word that creates tons of fear, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I, give, I give one example. When I give again this example of the city of Vancouver. When they actually did that zoning from single family to duplex blanket over the whole city, mm -hmm. um, what does it really increase? It only increases the number of people that use one volume of space because the the density is not increased from a floor space point of view. Mm. There is no increase at all. Right? So it's the same it's the same house, right? And you just put different things in. That's all it is. And it increases, which is what the pilot project that uh, at the top of Kate Hill does, it increases the ownership opportunity. Yes. So instead of one person owning a million dollar home with a secondary suite, and in Vancouver's case, a laneway house, it, it means two people can own that at $700,000 or whatever. No, no, instead yeah, of, yeah. like, that's the idea is that it increases, it makes more affordable options yeah. and ownership, but it doesn't necessarily increase, yeah, the building size, the volume, the, anything like that. Um, and I think they did allow secondary suites, so that might increase the number of households. But yeah. Is, is there an alternative you could use? alternative word you could use. I mean, I know that Andy around gentle density, which always makes me giggle. I think it sounds yeah. silly. Um, well, I mean, the cluster housing zoning ones that I said, the, they use the language of it's, uh, and I can't remember what it is, but it's um, like building in the density, and I think they do use that term, so that it fits in with the neighborhood. And I know that's what Vancouver did some work on a few years ago. It was like, how do we create some some gentle density or whatever in these neighborhoods that fits in the, it fits in the scale, which is what that duplex thing does. It fits in the scale of the neighborhood. It's not an apartment building. It's not, you know, this massive scary thing. And that it's just these little things that get inserted into existing neighborhoods. And and yeah, I don't know. I've I don't know. Things what talking about like increased housing choice, right? Housing choices like, or something. People use. They they get more and more abstract in terms of what it is. Yeah, exactly. ambiguous kind like, of words. You know, yeah. Because you you know yes you say instead of increased housing right it's like. Well, and I like the way you're you know instead of density equals fear what equals love and community mm -hmm. yes. like what are those words <laughs> yeah. that we can say like like housing your neighbors like I like to use those terms yes. especially yeah. on Bowen we are all neighbors mm -hmm. like if I don't know you we know somebody in common mm -hmm. there is one degree of separation on Bowen right mm -hmm. yeah. and so we are all neighbors so it's actually housing your neighbors mm -hmm. like if my neighbor had a flood 
and couldn't stay in their house, I would immediately invite them into my home. Mm -hmm. Like no question, they could come and stay with me, right? Because it's just, that's what you do with your neighbors. But just because you're some person who lives on the other side of the island and you work at a shop and I've never met you, you know, it's, it's like we need to find housing for our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do we help more neighbors live in this neighborhood? Yeah. You know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. to make a healthy community. Yeah. 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 So how can you housing our how neighbors? How can you stay you know? in the in the in the neighborhood you love so? Yeah. Right? And that's what exactly and that's one of the things I love about if there was these little pocket cluster things in each the downsizing. Because there are many people yeah. who need to downsize from their large home with large stairs and property and all that stuff, and there's nowhere for them to go. Mm -hmm. And imagine if each neighborhood had a little a little cluster of little bungalows that 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 elders or whatever could move yeah. into, mm -hmm. and then so they could downsize but stay in their neighborhood mm -hmm. and stay in your friends. Yeah, keep their friends, keep their connections, Huge. Huge. and Great. keep walking the trails and going to the beaches or whatever it is that they do all the time. So we need to find words though because there's, there's a difference. Like yeah. housing your neighbors, I love, and what you said is wonderful, but yeah. in the context of a sentence, and yeah. density is a harsh word in itself. Density you guys are very familiar with it, but when I first heard it, I was like, yeah. I think you're right. It just, it's but it just it has it has, it has, it has to be yeah. Yeah. fear and like yeah, and it yeah, it is yeah. So okay. it just has to be. We have to just how wordsmith slightly to find yeah. a term that works. So what was your story, Dan? I've forgotten. I said housing needs to create said. a healthy community. Yeah. yeah. Or to uh, sustain a healthy community. Healthy community. Enable a healthy community. Something. Some verb. But it sounds like that's a goal as opposed to a tool. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's hard to. How do we replace that? What you, providing what your neighborhood needs mm -hmm. or yeah. wants. Because then it's, it's, it sets it more like, okay, what do we need? What do we want? If people say we don't need anything, we're happy here, and everybody else can bugger off, then that's the answer, right? But I think in lots of neighborhoods, if you give some examples yes. of this, is things that we may need, right? right? Here's other words for housing that will be. density in it, though. Yeah. Right. Density, high density, density. Uh, Metro cool. uses compact communities. Mm. They talk about compact. Yes. That's clever. But you know, uh, you're up against the big fear of the single family homeowner having his lot value detected. And that's his retirement. Well, the so lifestyle more. Like it's, it's not all about money, I think. It's love of this lifestyle. I'm making it simplistic. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you know what? And I was going to say, from my memory of what went on at the time of the pilot project at the top of Cates Hill, that was people's argument. They were fearful that this density was going to affect their property values mm -hmm. and the argument to that because it is it's an immediate fear reaction and you're right like a lot of people have money in their retirement or whatever in their home in the value of their home um uh and in, in I, from what i understand and i'm not a um uh, valuer of buildings but um when you value your property a single family home is not compared to a multi-family home so a duplex is not value compared to a single family house. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you could argue that, you know, say if you built an apartment building full of low income people and there was drug dealers and all that kind of stuff that you bring the neighborhood down and yes, your property value. Uh, but I mean that's examples actually because like there's yeah. lots of examples where duplexes are highly expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at areas like, you know, Kids Point, uh, mm -hmm. Point Grey, you know, go on and on, right? But like appraisers <laughs> don't do that. So when appraisers go to value a house, yeah. right, they literally compare it like for like. So they will not compare it with the duplex next door or the triplex down the street. They will compare it with the single family house there and the single family house there. So like that's how but they do their work, right? right? But, but you know, like, again, I'm going to give the same example of the city of Vancouver selling yeah. duplex. Yeah. The, as you know, in the west part of Vancouver, the values are going like this, yeah. right? Because they went Great. up, yeah. <laughs> and now they're coming Great. right down. Yeah. But a lot of people want to live there. Mm -hmm. The duplex zoning allows that. <coughs> so I actually think that at a certain point, at a certain point, the land values will be higher because of the duplex zoning, mm. and it works, can work both ways. Yes, right? agreed. I think it can work both ways, yeah. So mm -hmm. if it's a desirable form of, of of housing that people actually want, yeah. right? Because they can afford it. Those those two components can 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 provide higher value mm -hmm. than the one. And I think we just I think we gave the last time an example that we actually the first one that came into our office was just a month ago <coughs> at the corner of Forty Fifth and whatever uh, in in uh, in Kerstdale. And um, it is really interesting because it allows a family, right, that they have the 
the, the, the daughter with her husband and kids, the other daughter and another one are going to each buy a unit in that building. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know but how, but how the formula works doesn't really matter. Yeah. The nice thing too is that suddenly they can create the unit they actually want. Give yeah. me an example. The, it's, if you have the way that it's kind of written, the, the duplex zone, it kind of assumes that they will be side by side as if they're two thirty-three foot lots, right? This yeah. is a big lot, by the way. This is 66. Um, um, but the way our client looks at it, he says, well, no, um, we just have that big house and we want to use it the best way to, our, to the use for our family. So the upper floor is one big suite, level, mm. you know? You know, if you have an elevator, you know, yeah, there's only one stair up, right? 2,000 square feet. You know what I mean? So that is totally different. Mm -hmm. then, if you, then if you look at this, if you have, if you have a, a townhouse, three stories, let's say 1,800 square feet, mm -hmm. 600 per level. Mm -hmm. It feels small, tiny, mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, it's agree. terrible, yeah. right? And it's good, you stay healthy, that's it. <laughs> but it's all, everything is small and you use only part of your house. Now you have 1,800 square feet apartment. That is huge, you know why? Because you use everything all the time. Mm -hmm. So then if you have that apartment and people walk into it, in that house, right? That creates value. So mm -hmm. what I find so interesting about it is that I think yes, you're right in general, you know that single family homes still are kind of overvalued. But the, um, if you look at what happens as land gets more precious and more dense, I think that flips around. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And anyways, it was, I think you're right. There is going to be fear of that from from. I mean, there's just always going to be people that are going to be worried about whatever word we come up with. <laughs> yeah. Compact neighborhoods, um, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Compact Not communities. Yeah. But, it, but I've, I've been using that diverse housing. Diverse. That's kind of been the one I've been going for. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't think we're going to solve that one today either, but I think it's a good idea to think about it. Actually, I am. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Good and loving. How do you deal with the entity, right? <laughs> with the <Yeah>. words. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe, the, I mean, maybe it's that simple. Anyways, I, that's one of the words that I've been using is diverse housing, and maybe that's it, because that sounds a lot friendly to me than density. Mm -hmm. Creating diverse housing, creating some townhouses, creating some yeah. apartments, creating some downsized bungalows, like mm -hmm. whatever it is, they're diverse. They're different from the predominant single family yeah. house. It's diverse housing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyways, okay. So, uh, Daniel, anything more on tools or we'll just kind of revisit them as we yeah. go through? Okay. Uh, so next one is, oh, so mine was all, I've already kind of talked a bit about cluster zoning. So if we want more specifics in that, I can look them up. But um, it was just kind of the idea, I think, that if you had a, and this is more suburban because Maple Ridge, which is quite a suburban yeah. place, and even Gibson's is, is a little different because they're just kind of a more compact small town. But it's taking somewhat suburban lots that are probably more generous, not like our acre size ones, but you know, somewhat generous um, lots. And then saying you could build four, six, or eight small, you know, whether they're attached or detached, I can't remember all of the details, but the idea that you can take that. And it's still at the scale of the neighborhood, you know. So that's just kind of the principle of them. And I think it would be really cool because. Can, yeah, I, I just think that would be worth revisiting, and whether it's a pilot project or whether it's we, you know, it's decided that well, SR two or whatever, whichever zone it's allowed, or you know what I mean, or like we're gonna pilot one per neighborhood, come talk to us or whatever it is. I think it would be really interesting to see if there was if there was interest in that, and and it goes back to that whole rezoning certainty. If 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 the council and the municipality decide this is what we want, and let's test it out come talk to us and then work together on it, as opposed to one person having to do a whole bunch of work, take the risk, come and ask for rezoning, not really know if it can be a more collaborative thing to create the housing that, that is decided if the community needs. Did they, like Gibson, does their zoning, you know, they said cluster, did they do something with the rest of the lot? No, I think it's not sort of a conservation development. Yeah. It's yeah. not about that. It's about using the lot in a different way. So as opposed to having, um, as opposed to having, say, um, one big lot with a house like that, yeah. you take that same lot and you build yeah. six, 
you know, it's kind of similar to what Fritz was saying, like six smaller, you know, six smaller ones that probably maybe don't have much more floor space. Yeah. They're a similar height and scale to the surrounding, you know, whatever houses are around here. It's just instead of sort of having one house with a whole bunch of lawn or, yeah. you know, property, that you actually break it up and just create, again, that de the, the diverse yeah. housing um, as opposed, and then you have potentially six people that own or, or live there or whatever as opposed to one family maybe with a suite or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, 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 anyways, I can send them to you if you want them as an app, I'm happy to send them to everybody. Or I can sit, you can sit here and read them, but I'm not sure if that's the best use of our time because it's more that principle. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, then the next one, actually maybe, do you want to go over, I know you sent it out, Daniel, do you want to just go over the, the your, your one year update on the secondary detached suite? Yeah, okay, and that was, comes, it looks in like an email. It's a printout that looks like an email. Yeah, from the Steph, yeah, Steph Shorts is on the top. So that was a has, um, has for our, our building permits for detached secondary suites, and then, Send it out to see what what has what have we approved since um, since we adopted the detached secondary suite bylaw in 2016. Mm -hmm. So we've had seven detached secondary suites in that time. Um, and additionally, note here two dwellings that were constructed. People, um, one of them actually received the development permit for the detached secondary suite, and the other one had I think the other one was far enough away to be one. But essentially, they were both did it fully telling us and in, intending it to be the detached secondary suite when they come to build them. So that's why we've included it in the, the numbers. Um, and then at the same point, we've had nine attached secondary suites built as part of new dwellings and three new um, secondary suites built as renovations. And that's all within a year, Daniel? No, so that's 2017, 2018, and today the 20, so it's 21. Yeah, you did so well. Yeah. So in the last two and a, two and a half years. Yeah. Do you have any knowledge of? The use of those units has it been just for within the family to create a granny suite, or has it been mm -hmm. to create worker accommodation housing? I don't know. Yeah. We've never done. Yeah, and that's part of it. I think in terms of when we go back to councils, so maybe I should we'll write letters to everyone's built them and say how do you use them. My sense is like now I'm trying to think it through. I know a couple of the secondary suites people talk about they think for their families would be attached, but generally. Generally, definitely the ones as part of New Orleans, people are building them as rental housing. Um, and I don't know the detached. Do you know a couple? I know a couple of them are rentals. I just know, and I know like one was for a caretaker on the site. And so there's sort of a mix. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if you compare that with um, 2015, 2016, the, the attached suite, yeah. do you have a sense of how many would have been built in, in the attached suite? I, I don't have that yeah. here, um, but, I check, but I think up, because I know when I, so I started in 2015, and we'd approved attached secondary suites in 2008, and when we were doing the detached, sec, or we approved attached secondary suites, and when I was doing the detached secondary suites, I was pulling the numbers of suites we'd approved up till then, mm -hmm. and it wasn't very many, mm -hmm. like it was, you know, in that eight years, I don't think maybe they've been like a couple a year or something. Mm -hmm. But some of that goes, like 2009, 2010, there's basically no building on the wall. Like, one of those years we did like two houses or something crazy. Right, yeah. Um, so but some of it is as building is, you know, ramped up 2017, 2018, we did yeah. much more building and people were clearly building suites in the dwelling as part of, like if you're going to build a new house on Bowen, you're, you're almost more likely than not to put a suite in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds to me like 21 units in two and a half years sounds like a pretty good uptake, but mm -hmm. not overwhelming, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And definitely, you, yeah, with the detached secondary suites, it's like, yeah, we've had seven that we wouldn't have had otherwise, which is great. I don't think anyone feels like, now my neighborhood has changed drastically. How many houses at that time? Um, and I don't have that here again. That's what Maureen asked me. Like, That's a good question. Do you have a sense of how many houses? Roughly, the 2017, we, we did way more, we maybe did 40, and maybe normally our own ball is like 20. Interesting. Well, we've got it by proxy because our population has simplistically increased by about 80 people a year over the last five years, going from about 3,600 to 3,900. So, simplistically, two and a half people are there. 
Yeah, yeah. it's about 30, 35 ish. Yeah. You know, for you, for the, I'd like to take a step back. I was just thinking is if you want to get feedback from the neighborhood what they want, and if you would uh, prepare a, a flyer, something that mm -hmm. people get in the mailbox or so, and you would, would, you would ask them if they would... Uh, I just wrote it, scribbled it down, it's not well thought out, okay? Who would, like, who would like to apply for the following spot zone? Mm -hmm. You have to really introduce that. It, you have to introduce it and describe it really well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, it's about that. It's personal. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you have a property and you would like to do something like this, mm -hmm. you know, and you give an you give an example, then maybe maybe one or two people or maybe ten out of the neighborhood actually reply and say, mm -hmm. well, "I wouldn't mind doing that." Yeah. Now you have. Or I'd like this in my neighborhood. Yeah. Like yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you may not want to do it on your property, but if somebody did it down the road, you might sell and buy it. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. valid? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, but because now you have, uh, I would be very surprised if that would be received in a negative way because mm -hmm. it's a question, and you, and mm -hmm. and you give an introduction that makes sense that people like to stay in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? You know, and maybe they want to be developed the little house they're in. No. <laughs> um, the neighborhood has some choice in its character and how it maintains its neighborhood. Yeah. It's not a, yeah. uh, a top down policy from the, mm. for the whole island yeah. put upon them. It's, it's yes, that would be really choice. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and it goes back to diversity. There might be neighborhoods that don't want any of it and just want to see a single family, and that's fine. And then there might be other ones that it pops up more. And, and that again just leads to the diversity and kind of yeah. back to this principle of like rethinking that everything's not co-focused. If we get a lot of mm -hmm. feedback from the community that oh no, like these different neighborhoods are really quite interested in it, it just you know, lends strength to that. And if you have an um, example in one neighborhood, the other neighborhood may get to um, jobs because they may want it as well. Mm -hmm. You mean you almost turn mm -hmm. around? You see what I mean? Yeah, it's a gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just for context, in yes. 2018, there were 23 homes built. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then we, at the same time, we did 11. So it's almost half. But Interesting. Had more. secondary suites? 23 buildings built, like 23 okay. new houses. And how many? And we did 11 suites. Okay. At that time. Um, and then in 2017, we did 39 houses, okay. and just seven. So. Okay, quite different. Yeah. And I, as far as I understand, I don't know if they're houses, but this year is like gangbusters. The, the amount of building permits is a lot this year, isn't that so far? Yeah, I mean, we're enough? still below 2017. Oh, we are? Okay. We, yeah. For whatever reason, this year we have a lot of variances. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> they're all listed <laughs> slightly differently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. So I guess what my thinking was is, do we as a committee want to make any comment on that? Like. Because my thing when it came up, like two years ago or whenever it was being discussed, this limit of, and I know it was discussed at council level of is it an acre more at the 0.9 acres or whatever it was, um, and some discussion again, going back to the OCP, it's no co density and all of that kind of stuff. Like, I would, wouldn't mind if we created a recommendation that council consider a change to that minimum lot size and seeing what, like, so the uptake's been reasonable, not overwhelming. There hasn't been, as far as I know, or major complaints about it being integrated into existing neighborhoods that would council consider, you know, or we recommend that they look at adjusting down that minimum lot size and seeing what other neighborhoods might fit into. I think it was part of council's um, discussions all, all along that we would take that year and see how things mm -hmm. went. It's been a bit longer mm -hmm. than that now. And that the lot size would be revisited. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily changed, but certainly revisited. So if, if you've got a report pending at some point. In which areas is that? Is it all, all or is it? Sorry? In which areas? Well, it went by lot size. Yeah. It wasn't by neighborhood yeah. or zoning. It was yeah. lot size. It's yeah. true. But yeah. That I actually think is kind of a mistake in the land use bylaw. Mm. The, the, the standard zones are all over the place, 
and not necessarily really suitable for a specific neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But in, in some sense, this detached secondary suites bylaw really deals just with lot size, yeah. mm -hmm. rather than yeah. what the zone. And, I mean, is. it's yeah. slightly than a, a proxy in that, like some neighborhoods, I mean, it, there's basically there's no lots that are bigger. Right, so by lot size, I'd say okay, it's not appropriate in the loop. It's not appropriate in Miller's Landing, almost right. Or blue water, like blue most water, of the sites blue water, not you know, yeah. Big. So, yeah. so when I did the map of then where it ends up being allowed, right, mm -hmm. it's probably saying this is a you know largely rural yeah. area, right? Because you're thinking it's like along Adams and Sunset and, and Cape Roger Curtis or Cape Curtis, like Woods Road. You, know, you think where the larger lots are, yeah. that they're not in, it's not in the loop, not in. It's the almost the rule to stop density happening in the cove. Yeah, like in Calgary, it's, 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 it's a funny one. Yeah, it's a funny one. Put that kind of unit in. Yeah. Yeah, but so the way, um, what I'm afraid about just subdivision to smaller lots <coughs> that doesn't necessarily achieve what you want. Mm. Um, the word clustering. In the OCP is kind of used in a very strange way, I find. Mm. <coughs> um, it's first in the, in the uh, it says clustering is clustering of smaller lots, being not 10 acres, but for instance, two acres. Like loop. Uh, in, in one area, and then the, the balance stays, the, the total number of lots stays at the same average, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really do anything. You still have large lots that. I kind of think that if you start to, to, to subdivide, you will be better off to subdivide small pieces of a big lot and say that is for cluster housing, for instance. Mm -hmm. but, but the acreage discussion isn't subdivision. That's not a discussion. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. attached secondary suites are specifically not subdivisions, not right. strata. Well, they go to, the, yeah. that, uh, to, to this thing, right? Yeah. And it's really easy to see how much you can add without changing the rural character. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyways, I, I don't know as yeah. a committee, are we willing or able to um, just make a recommendation, maybe to include in your report to council that the Housing Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. you know, strongly recommends council consider expanding detached secondary suites to smaller lots? Mm. I don't know if, do you think, would we benefit from just looking at the secondary suites regulations as a whole and saying, okay, maybe it's one of those things in the size, but then, you know, some of the sort of saying, maybe you'd have, right now we say you have either or, but maybe it's saying mm -hmm. you could have both, or larger lots if you're a bigger lot, you can, right. so, or you think there's more than one change to, to secondary suites. Okay, yeah, so maybe we should do that. Part. Okay. Yeah. So maybe next meeting? Sure. Is that Yeah, I can just bring okay? up the secondary suites, what the current regulations are. Okay, be good. Let's do that. We'll have that added to the agenda. Because like in, in rural areas, you, you can have tons of accessory buildings, yep. and some of them are huge, like, you know, like chicken farms and stuff like yes. that. And um, so from a lasting point of view, or from a rural character point of view, from an aesthetic point of view, there's nothing about having more detached. Uh, you, you can even have some mm -hmm. kind of design guidelines if you want it to look mm -hmm. super cute and rural as in, in the calendar that hangs on the wall, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but some of it did address that. Like I remember, you know, if you wanted, uh, without doing development permit, if, if you were like, I can't remember what it was, 10 meters from your lot line or something, meters. 30 meters from the property line. So like basically nobody's ever going to see it or be affected yeah. by it. So I mean, there were things already in there discussing, mm. you know, addressing that. Mm. Um, yeah, anyways, I think that's good. Let's, let's put that on the list for next time to actually just relook at that whole bylaw, which isn't huge, I'm sure. Yeah. So that won't be yeah, it's, really, it's like one little section of our land use bylaw right. and then the definitions of it. Yeah. Okay, so that won't be hard for next time. And I think that's a good suggestion to do it comprehensively. Okay, so I'm going back to our agenda for today. Um, so shall we, well, yeah, do we want to jump in? So we had, um, and Chris, maybe we've already done this. Do you have, is there more specific work that you've done on the overview of the land use bylaw beyond this diagram and what we've already discussed? And then whether we need to, I know one of the things that also came up in your review was definitions. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. and, and Daniel, you've identified that too, is whether it's worth looking at um, definitions. 
And I feel like, I think we're doing okay for time. It's like 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. Just um, on the time issue, I have to teach a lesson at 10 to at half past. So okay, so you have to duck quarter past. Okay. I just do. Yep, yeah. okay, thanks. Um, and I think we'll delete five, unless, you know, it might just come up in our discussions. And then we, we have touched a bit, but if we want to get to that, the process challenges, we could talk about that. But, you know, we can take the next half hour or so to talk about definition of land use bylaw examples. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you want to, oh, Daniel, do you want to jump in? Or, or Chris? I say, I'd love for it to go to this page of his. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, so which page are we looking at? The, the last. Okay, the so where it starts with floor areas. area? Yeah. 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 Talk? Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Let's jump so, in. A number of things we have already touched on in an OCP kind of framework, yeah. but the, um, <coughs> the work on the LUB needs to be updated as it is out of date and reflects the global climate mindset and political climate of 15 to 20 years ago. All kinds of assumptions are embedded in the LUB. Then I give an example. Um, the LUB uses definitions to clarify LUB principles and OCP policies. However, definitions can limit or alter the intended purpose of the Bible. Definitions need to be updated to clarify the purpose of the Bible and not necessarily limit the effectiveness of the Bible. If you take floor area, then the um, definitions, if, if I didn't skip it by accident, uh, doesn't include the definition for basement. Now, the reason why the word basement always bothers me is that um, it is seen many times in the context of secondary suites. And secondary suites can be anywhere. It doesn't say they have to be in basements. But I think the basement should be added to the definitions. So I write down basement to be added to the definitions and needs to set standards to provide livable, comfortable living, lower floor living spaces such as minimum ceiling heights. And then crawl spaces to be added to the definitions. Crawl spaces are excluded from floor space ratio should be, well, Bowen doesn't really use for space ratio, but if you set the maximum house size, and if typically crawl spaces are excluded from FSR, and should be low, four or five feet, suitable for extra storage, etc., but not for borderline living. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you one example. If you go to the city of Vancouver, uh, of Victoria, and if you would uh, want to buy a house, and if you look at the listings, and if you visit these houses, it says it has a basement, good chance it's seven feet, or it's six feet eight, or six feet whatever. But it's borderline. And that is because for the longest time, um, secondary streets were evil, right? And municipalities have done anything to exclude them. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, results that were unintended in Bibles. And now they have all these houses that have seven feet basements, and guess what, they're all secondary streets, right? Or there's, they're, uh, they're listed as potential mortgage helpers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay but, um, if, if floor area is more defined, um, um, so for example, right, um, um, to, to get better lower floors, let's forget the word, the word basement for a second, um, the Bowen Island could consider to permit, to permit increased floor space or increased building height to obtain livable, comfortable basements that are suitable for rental accommodation. Right? I mean, this is just like a no-brainer in a way, right? Why wouldn't you do that? And uh, for example, in secondary suites, there's a whole page in these notes that I made that regulates secondary suites. And you wonder why. Um, one of them is, it says, a, a, sec a principal residence can only contain one secondary suite, which implies that, and the maximum is a thousand square feet all over the island. That implies that you built a thousand square feet secondary suite, which would normally be a two bedroom or maybe a tight three bedroom. And let's say if you would allow 1200 square feet, and it's an area that we have mostly needs one, one bedroom secondary suite, so maybe even bachelors. And if it's in an area close to the cove, and maybe there is less car use, and maybe um, there could be three small uh, bachelor suites. So, but the bylaw already assumes you can only have one secondary suite, so that well, maybe you should remove that. Then it says that it has to be smaller than the primary residence, which I can kind of see why that 
is in there, but I can I also know that lots of people like them for downsizing in the future. And then you know, somehow are you as an owner supposed to live in the bigger suite because that's the principal residence? Mm -hmm. I mean, why? It is, should say it can have two suites mm -hmm. and one of them you can rent, okay. right? But if, what, if a, what if it's more important that the house is rented out because it provides more Income. rental accommodation for families, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, but it's in the, it's, it's in the land use Bible. Um, <coughs> and then I wrote on, and then if the, if one thing creates fear in one neighborhood, it doesn't necessarily create fear in another neighborhood. Yeah. So, and that goes back to if you ask people what they want. Um, so I thought that you could create different rules for uh, secondary suites or in different neighborhoods, you know. Um, and why not? And then if you give these examples, that in some cases, like on this diagram, that the secondary suite has hardly impact at all, mm -hmm. then maybe actually on a large property, which isn't necessarily so far from the cove, right? <laughs> um, you could allow more than one um, accessory building and more than one secondary suite. You could allow more secondary suites, either or, and, you know, detached <laughs> on the so property. I have a question. I can't remember if it's building code based or if it's just standard. Like, what's the driver behind the 40% of it being like secondary to the... The 40% and the 90 square meters are building code. Okay. Well, so sort of it's like, if, if it fits that definition, then in the building code, there's less of requirements for like spatial separation. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Right. So as a result, local governments everywhere have kind of mimicked the same language. Now, if you didn't have the same language, I guess if someone wanted to build a, what we would call in the zoning bylaw, a secondary suite, the building code would say, okay, you have to build it like it's another dwelling. Right, so different fire ratings potentially, yeah, yeah, different more onerous things. Okay. Yeah, but so it's kind of like, you know, in some way we would it's copy it because we're like, well, it's easier. Versus mm -hmm. if somebody's just going to build 1,800 square feet and they want to build two 900 square foot you know, a, 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 a unit and a secondary suite, then we say, okay, well, right now we'd say, well, you can't, because it's right, not 40%. It's not like 60, 40, if we didn't have that yeah. in, then we would say, okay, now in the building code, you're going to have to do more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but more stuff is not necessarily yeah. overly expensive. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually think it's the best that secondary suite meet the requirements anyway for fire um, rating and yeah. all that kind of stuff, because, yeah. well, and because if you have a uh, duplex, it's all about fire rating and sound rating. Yeah. Now, why wouldn't you want it in from a secondary suite? Yeah. God be not who's renting to a suite. Yeah. And actually, just <laughs> anecdotally, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear from people, either from not having a great living situation or hesitation on renting out, is sound and privacy. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, like, is that something that we should be encouraging anyways, as opposed to saying I mean, you can get away with these lesser things? Should we actually be Well, some of it, I think, because it's, it's harder to do in that like to renovate. Absolutely to retrofit. Sure. Yeah, Absolutely. but okay, but this is an example that one piece of legislation uh, restricts somehow in your mind another piece of legislation. But I think that's wrong. I think you just have to, the, the, um, the land use file can just uh, facilitate secondary speeds of all kinds of sizes and whatever you want, right? Then if you have to meet the building code, you can meet the building code, either one way or another. You don't have to be in the section yeah. that does the least. Yeah. No, I'm not saying you don't have to say that's where it came from. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, and that was my question. Because it's, yeah, it's yeah, everywhere, yeah. this 40%, the 90 square yeah. meters or whatever it's, you know, so just, it's, and that's like, I couldn't yeah. remember. But from a zoning point of view, I would just ignore them. Well, and then maybe that's what we're, yeah, yeah like that's what we're talking about is saying, and in my mind, the, di the difference between secondary suite means that it's owned by one person, and that one part, one part of it is in theory occupied by them as the primary owner and then one yeah. part is rented out to somebody on a long-term basis like that's the driver behind it whether they rent out for other short-term rentals we won't get into that but um yeah i think that it doesn't it would be nice if we could think about letting go of those restrictions yeah. of size and percentage and so if somebody just wanted to build two the same like like you said with that family situation what if there were two siblings or parents and, a, and a, yeah. you know children with, with their own children wanted to build two sort of side by side somewhat similar sized or one above the other mm -hmm. whatever yeah. um you know it would be nice if they were allowed to do that so it's single ownership still two different spaces and they're not restricted this 
restricted to the 60-40 split or... It's actually misleading because yeah. in, 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 in Vancouver, a single family house, right, all single family houses can have a secondary suite and a layman's house. Yeah. Right? That means there are three families living yes. in a single, single, single family, family home. Yeah. In a duplex, you can only have a single family uh, situation with a secondary suite, no layman's house. Ah, uh, okay. Right? Yeah. right? So the, that can actually be the same, so the parcel we're working on, 66 feet wide, yeah. could be subdivided theoretically, which is not going to happen in that, in that area, yeah. into two 33s. There could be six units there. Right. But that's two single family homes, with right. six units. Yeah. With strata type, with um, strata type units, you can have two single family, two, like two, two duplex homes, yeah. which are primary residences, I should say. Yeah. Uh, each with a secondary suite. So actually the density would be lower than mm -hmm. on a 33 foot pole. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Density, right? Yeah. Dangerous word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's, I mean, I think these are valid discussions that, that upon mm -hmm. review of, uh, like this land use bylaw review that Dan was undertaking, is to really look at these definitions of secondary suites and maybe it's just address that you know, if you want to comply with 40% and 90 square meters, here's, you know, we're working with this and this building code, but, you know, if you want to build two 1,200 square foot suites or dwellings, whatever, well, whatever we want to call them, um, you know, that's okay, but you have to meet these different parts yeah, of the building code. Yeah, but I would say you just have to comply with the building code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So more, more, sorry, I'm not thinking in the land use by the more when you're explaining it to yeah, people. Yeah, like information a, sheet. An yeah. information sheet would explain yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yes, you're right, not the language yeah. of the land use yeah. by law, but it would be nice if we could consider letting that go as a restriction. Yeah. on the secondary suites. And just thinking like there's other places in the land use by where we'll allow things that then have knock on building code implications. Like, yeah. right. like in the village by the code we allow smaller setbacks. Right? Which is great, but suddenly then it triggers no window well, it triggers all these building code stuff that yeah. you know. So we go, Oh it's so nice we let you be closer and then they yeah. go like, oh, but Windows by the way is, is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. now think about all these things. But the, we building, the building code changes too, you know, every yeah. Yeah. five yeah. years or so Absolutely. there's another iteration. Okay, good. So, um, do we need to make any notes on that, or do you feel like verbally, Daniel, we've kind of given you enough feedback on that? Because really, mostly what we're doing today is to like yeah. give Daniel this information so he yeah. can incorporate it into his more formal report. I mean, I think with this, like, if if we come back next time and just talk about secondary suites for a period, and then yeah. and then if you want to make a I, I refer, like a recommendation that goes into maybe your specific. Okay, so maybe could we do that at the same time as the detached secondary suites? Yeah. Should we bring yeah. the secondary yeah. suites and detached secondary suites yeah. Yeah. and look at them yeah. together? Yeah. And then yeah. we can make some formal recommendations? Yeah. Okay, so let's yeah. put that on the agenda. Oh, so Sam, were you able to make a note for next agenda? Mm -hmm. um, we were. We want to have a line item that we're going to review the detached secondary suite and the secondary suite bylaws with Daniel. But what should be included in my mind is the, which is probably ends up doing anyway, yeah. is to use uh, maximum floor space and floor space bonuses. Well, let's keep talking about that. We've still got some time. It's only 11. Because that's one of the big mm -hmm. things that I see in the land use bylaw review. And I liked, I think I like this multi, multiple tier. Is that what we, the word we use? Okay. Yeah, like, I think multi -tier. multiple leaves it open, right? Like so multiple, if it's two is fine, if it goes to three, multiple, multi tier. Yeah. Um, I really like that idea because I feel like, uh, again, as like an overarching thing, it's saying this is what we want to incentivize. So, of course, you can build your single family house on your single family lot if that's what you want, but we believe the community needs more of this. So, here is what we want to incentivize you to build. So, build your 2,000 square, whatever the numbers decided, but you can get extra if you build this and extra if you build that. And I liked one of the things that you'd said is, um, and I don't know how you it would incorporate this into land use bylaw specifically, but like ready to rent, or I can't remember what the word means, ready to be a suite. So even if say you wanted your 3,000 square foot house, you built the suite so essentially it was ready to go, you make use of it personally, but that all of the fire ratings and the plumbing yeah. and the whatever is there, it's built in ready to go so that it wouldn't take much to actually lock Red, it off. Ready, so Red so. ready, kind of whatever language you want to use. Yeah, I mean, I think reality, you know, we would just then, to do that, we would just say to put it in a secondary suite. And right. then people, people can, you have to build it and people have to finish it, I guess, to be right. a suite. Like we'd say, it's got a kitchen show, but you don't put it in you know, the cabinets or whatever. It but is. you can, like, yeah, yeah. Like, well, rental ready means that all the 
all the rough in is rough in, yeah. is in, so all the rough ins are in, and that it's basically the, the building inspector says, yes, this meets the requirements of yeah. the building code. Yeah. But nobody says that you have to put in the kitchen or that you have to put in the toilet, but everything is, is, is kept. Yeah, and maybe yeah. that's I mean, at minimum, it's rough. I mean, the city of Vancouver is actually using it in a way, but they have their own legislation, right? But yeah. the, um, they are asking that every house on the main floor right. has a, a shower, like a bathroom with a shower, okay. not just the parking room, right? It, it doesn't and the really doorways. work, it's kind of weird yeah. in a way, because you, know, you may have to go up to the porch first, mm -hmm. and, uh, right. You sleep upstairs. <laughs> it doesn't really work, right? But it's their intention is that it makes it more accessible. And wider doorways, I think yeah. even slightly wider hallways. Yeah, it's about um, aging in place and universal access and stuff. Um, I wonder, um, with 50% roughly of the new homes going in already thinking in terms of yeah. people maybe ahead of this discussion in, in some respect for the for the new home builds. Where does that, do you know where that interest comes from? Is it that the owners are requesting that? The builders are recommending that? Like I'm trying to think, I know we actually had, which is where we bought like a couple back houses get built with suites. suites. Um, because it makes it more saleable. Yeah, and I think people looking who are stretching are putting in suites. Mm -hmm. But also because you, I think it's really key that you have to be rental ready, but you're not forced by the by, by, by the municipality to actually rent it out. Because the moment you do that, I think most people are not ready for that. Mm -hmm. They have their own privacy on their own lot, yeah. and now it's a bit broader telling them that they have to live differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it has yeah. to be by choice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like right now, it's like we allow secondary suites to be able to say. You know, you don't have to rent it. And people, well, people more built like accessory spaces, thinking of like my teenagers when they grow, you know, so yeah. they have somewhere. Yeah. 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 But the moment they, they're, they're used to it, it's much more likely that it will be used one time over the life of the book. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I don't want to people put it in thinking of resale. Because you see, even like in the real estate market now, on the moment, it's like the demand for something with a suite is like much more. And then you go, oh, now I can. Well, it may be something that they justify temporarily until I yeah. don't need it, and maybe then I have more kids and I, you know, can afford to have the whole house. Mm -hmm. They grow into the house and you grow out of the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. The other thing that we've, in our talking, mm -hmm. we've mostly been, maybe I'm wrong here, but we've mostly been talking about the building of a, of a place. Mm -hmm. um, so many of our secondary suites are, are going to be renovations of mm -hmm. existing homes and I, I'm, I'm not sure whether that affects our thinking about proposed um, changes to the existing mm -hmm. bylaws. I don't know if it makes a difference, yeah. but in, in terms of we should think of the knock-on effects, or we should yeah. think how yeah. it would yeah. yeah. impact yeah. renovations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alison. No worries. I feel like we're winding down. I realize yeah. we forgot to take a break. So <laughs> I feel like energy levels are winding down anyway, so I don't think we'll go too much longer. Um, bye. So is there anything else that we want to touch on before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Um, Nothing detailed, but I've, yeah. I've got a phone conversation scheduled with David Chisholm, who's um, one of the directors of Scrito, which runs the Victory Suites. <laughs> See lots of funny oh, words. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Runs what, sorry? The Victory Suites program. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. And Scrito is the Sunshine Coast economic, Regional Economic, or, yeah. regional economic no, Development no. Organization. Yeah. So mm. he's, oh, great. Um, I've okay. sent him a batch of questions about how it's going and great. what topics we mm -hmm. okay. have. Good. Okay. So, like, what was so the big takeaways? Maybe should we just kind of review the, the board and mm -hmm. what our big takeaways were? So, oh, yeah. Was, what was that? What was? Do you guys remember what Bob talked about? It was this New Jersey planned unit development mm -hmm. or something. I can't remember. 
I think I have some notes, but he, he gave a specific example in New Jersey of something. Do you remember I know, what it was? I don't remember. It was something Actually, like that may be a good example to use for instance for amenity zoning. You know, okay, like, because it probably it fits that it probably fits the framework. Okay. But the but it may be a great example. Okay. So you let's ask looking for example, next right? time he's at the meeting what it was. Mm -hmm. Well I was racking my brain. I looked at who's MJ? Yeah. Who's that person on that yeah. party? <laughs> <laughs> it was some, MJ. Exactly. It was yeah. some New Jersey um, Yeah. Policy about growth and something about yeah. yeah, you could get this many units, but you have to give up the land. It was kind of like conservation. I think right? it was kind of conservation cluster development. It was all along those lines. I don't think it was like completely revolutionary, but it was just yeah. a good example that he knew quite well okay. that he explained to us. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. So let's just maybe review the board. So I got at the beginning of our conversation with the OCP maybe taking a real look at this this development of some pop, you know, fictional, well, or, you know, theorized yeah. Yeah. Uh, population cap and what does that actually mean and, and is it relevant to the water and the sewer and really taking a fresh look at that. Because um, I think, sorry, yeah. just yeah. about it. Because our one, like, fixture, I think, is, like, the Islands Trust right. of carrying capacity, right? Right. and that's where that it comes from. It's like, not that, there's my look, I can't see there's ever been, like, Carrying capacity? Care study on like carrying capacity, right? So we've sort of been using, okay, what was in the 96 OCP? That's like the proxy, but then it's kind of a, a weak It feels proxy like now, go, 20 you know, years in, it's reduced yeah. for like, let's like take a fresh look at that, right? And because then we talk about, you know, like a 5,000 square foot house with a lawn and a swimming pool, yeah. water use is very different than a square. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. That's a good one, yeah. Transit, yeah. And, yeah, and transit needs road infrastructure yeah. is very different than if we say develop one or two hubs yeah. of higher density, d diverse housing or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah. Um, and then we said rethinking snug home only as the focus because that's been like a huge driver for decades mm -hmm. and is that still valid? Um, um, oh, and that principle you said about from that was identified in the housing was development only next to other development. Is that also it's still true, yeah. valid or is it, yeah. Um, and then looking at conservation development and cluster development, yeah. what do those mean? Because I think, was it cluster? Is that the term that's That's actually that's the two that's you're linked nicely, developed next to existing yeah. development, yeah. and then the conservation, they're almost kind of. Yeah, yeah. so just <laughs> re-looking at that, maybe yeah. with, a, with fresh eyes and, and yeah. new information. Because I think you said it talks about, like, still instead of 10 acre lots, two acre lots clustered together, yeah. and say, well, you know, yeah. like, is that really relevant? Now in in our you know in where we are today on Bowen yeah. Island, two acre lots, you know, um, and then I like this one about encouraging yeah. agriculture, um, yeah. and I think that was came from you, Daniel. It's like really looking at quite holistically, not just housing, but as a community, water, sewer, but food, agriculture, and being more open to what you know, encouraging agriculture and its supporting uses, which could include tourism. No one sparked off out of that, and it's a wish for what we do subsequently is I can see a value in the future of someone saying, I love Bowen Island as a community, I own a 10 acre lot, I would like to donate some of my land to create, to birch, to create a uh, secondary street housing on my 10 acre lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I, I think that we need to uh, tie in with Fritz's of what we could do on a 10 acre or a five acre lot, that we'd allow a special thing to, it, it needs fleshing out and there's mm -hmm. examples in the US okay to draw upon, but it, uh, I don't know, like, but yeah, like donations of land or something like that. Uh, does it have to be a, a development land? Well, the word donation is like, okay, development. okay, you have to die or so, and then you make a donation. Of land <laughs> for, <laughs> no, that's, should we say for non-profit or community use, like something like that? For community use, uh, for community benefit. Uh, so it's kind of along the lines of the um, amenity, but kind of more in like a little bit more retroactive or, okay. Um, community. Land uh, grants. Land grants. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. it's the right word as well. Yeah. Land grants. Housing land grants. Housing. And I think that's more under the land use bylaw as opposed okay. to OCP, right. but again, we don't have to be too specific today. But yeah, so land use bylaw is multi tiered zoning, incentivizing the needed housing. That's not quite phrased well. Uh, rental ready, I like that, and it would be interesting to start incorporating that. 
um, and that would be kind of part of the bonus, you know, maybe FSR. Yeah, you have to. Uh, that's something we should just add. Amenity zoning, you have to. Yeah, it's not that. You have to add the word amenity zoning. But yeah, it's over here. But oh, it's there, yeah. sorry. Okay. No, no, that's okay. No, it's kind of, it's a little all over the place. Amenity zoning. Um, and I just brought in FSR because most zoning on the island doesn't have FSR. No, exactly. Right? And so. It's a setback. So maybe right. we have to start thinking about that. Maybe not for the big 10 acre lots, no, but kind for. Of, we kind of have to, yes. Yeah, so maybe about. it's something we have to start thinking about, <laughs> and along with, maybe along with um, caps, right? Square foot caps. Because that that ties yeah. in with this, right? And, it's yeah. kind of like you have to have them yeah. together. You have to have right? them both, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, like, currently, you can't incentivize really. No. Yeah, with some like some site coverage with like thirty yeah. percent site coverage. You got it. Seventy five if you built less. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I think they're hand in hand with the coverage. If you build fifty thousand square feet less, then you can do this and this. Well, that's the whole point. Well, they actually, actually incentivized. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, multi-tier zoning, amenity zoning, bringing those definitions in with that rental ready. That's part of it as well. They're connected as well. Um, okay. For, yeah. So when you say amenities, are like, given amenities in Malayne? The OCP actually identifies yeah. them in some areas, but I think the what is accepted as an amenity may kind of... I think there was a kind of a rule, but I don't know if the rule actually exists, that it had to be somewhat that was neighborhood, that the amenities were useful let's say, in and around the development that was yeah. imposed. Like, you couldn't use justifying amenity that was on the other side of the island or so. Because yeah. we yeah. see this a money grab <laughs> to do something, you see what I mean? But, the, but I think that, that what, how you can use amenity zoning, it would be first actually checking the legislation, you know, from yeah. the community. Yeah, zoning. I just think, because you know, like, it's a density bonus and you do it, but you have to list in the zone. But they, they are they are listed in the yeah. OCP. Give some examples. I, 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 there's something about housing, but it's too restricted. I find it said like um, it was more like let's call it social housing yeah. in, in that kind of field, but not in general for smaller forms of housing yeah. and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So it may need to be. I think you have to um, for both of them for the. Uh, multi-tier zoning and for amenity zoning, both of them in the end you have to provide clarity what you're incentivizing, yeah. and then you have to check to which degree the overriding legislation of the municipality uh, allows that. But it's, I think it's probably broader than, than we think because I expect that lots of municipalities are Trying to do the same. As we're trying right, to do. and I guess I see it because I see like a many, one is like people do it through rezoning, right? So um, yeah. the, the Arbutus Ridge development has a covenant on that says they're going to give us with each building permit, first we build has to provide, and it's like sort of between 10 and 15 thousand dollars, I think, towards the community center. Right. So it's like an amenity that was done through rezoning and then a covenant. Yeah. Right? yeah. Versus in the zone, we could instead, you could zone in the like density bonus scheme and the zoning schedule just say, okay, if you want to build more than whatever, you pay this much per square foot, and it's just listed. Yeah, it, 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 it mentions sort of it, it money as well, it yeah. does. You, know? yeah. um, you would just have to find it, I mean, you find it, I'll find it, but it yeah. does, in, yeah. in both documents, you can yeah. find it. Yeah. So I think that's important to know, so clarifying what you want to incentivize, I'd say one in amenity zoning is community-based assets, yes. right, that we're incentivizing, yeah. and then in the multi-tiered one, it's probably pretty strictly housing, right? It's like, what are the housing things that we want to incentivize in multi-tiered? Well, you can probably do it in every type of zone, but I would think that for the housing committee, yes, it's more what can you achieve to get more housing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you can maybe allow more commercial somewhere too, if you do this or that. Right, yeah. If you build maybe you have to put some money in the housing fund or so, if right. you put it more commercial. I think it's just a tool. You have to kind of explore how well the tool works. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. we kind of do that in, in area one, the lot that's next to the museum kind mm -hmm. of has that. It has this relationship of residential to commercial 
space yeah. in the zone. So it allows a certain amount of residential and it allows up to a maximum, but only if you build some commercial space. Yeah. Because when council did it, they thought, okay, we wanted yeah. to see some commercial in that zone, so you get yeah. the staggered. And that's kind of the same, it's kind of multi tiered, yeah. right? It says you get this much residential, or if you build some commercial space, you get more residential. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, so we do so have precedent like on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I put incentivize needed, you know, dot dot mm -hmm. housing slash other slash money. Yeah. So it's but, but, but I guess what you don't want to do is to make it too strict and too much like a formula because yeah. in the zoning schedule because then if you force, okay, I'll give you an example, in, again in Vancouver you can see lots of empty um, commercial space, like yeah. uh, mostly yeah. retail, in some areas to the point of like why would they ever put it in, it's just a, it's just a formula that the city has been looking for yeah. and now a lot of it stands empty and people pay sky high taxes on it and it discourages these type of buildings to be built. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But this is four and a half, five times higher rate of taxation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if we went on, we kind of covered the different municipal tools. I don't think we have to maybe go over that. Um, although I do, yes, there, it would be really interesting to, to look at what, like, I don't even know what this is, but mm -hmm. somehow making a rezoning Yes, yeah. To more certainty or whatever. And mainly, it should just break this down for, you know, identified community needs. Mm -hmm. Not just for, you know, more single family houses, <laughs> right? More for if they want to do something that it's already been identified the community feel it needs, what can we do to mm -hmm. simplify that process or give some more certainty around rezoning? Um, and then we tried to brainstorm, and that was you were just saying, clarify what we're incentivizing, and that was what I was trying to get at when we sort of brainstormed yeah, this. Yeah. And I don't know how we answer that clearly, or if we just leave it up to staff. Um, but you know, like what um, you know, using the tool of pilot projects is it secure worker housing, townhouses, um, villages, so we don't have to choose this. we don't have to travel to the cove, yeah, from Blue Water to get you know some milk. So that idea, like. So the one that I would like to add to that is. Um, what I said, it wasn't very well formulated, mm -hmm. but who would like the following spot zoning in the neighborhood? Yeah, so I think How do you know? uh, during the housing needs assessment, ask neighborhoods what they want. Yeah, okay. These pilot project spot zoning. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah I think so, yeah. for sure. And then I think we sort of came up with a, another question as well, was similar along those lines. I can't remember what it was. I need a note. So one was, uh, yeah, asking neighbors what they want. Well, and the second one was maybe about detached secondary suites or something. I just, and I can't remember if everybody said it or if I just kind of came up with that. Um, is it worth in the housing needs assessment and maybe it's not the right place yeah. to say, you know, feedback. Like, have you had any issues with it or do yeah. you think it's okay or do you want more or, or I don't know, asking that question. Yeah. But yeah, I think maybe, and maybe it's just, maybe it's actually in the same question. Like, what do you think your neighborhood needs? More secondary suites, more detached secondary yeah. suites, or what would you like to see in your neighborhood? Or or maybe it's one of those scaled ones, like, is this appropriate? Do I want to see this in my neighborhood? No, I don't, or absolutely, yes, I do. On a scale of one to five, you know, this, So this, what would you just said there, right? Um, you, can, you can formulate the same question. Um, do you need space for your, uh, do you expect that you may need space for your elderly parents, or right. um, do you think your kids need yeah. it? Do you need that? But more from a personal point of view, yeah. because if you say you need a secondary suite, do you need a detached? It sounds more like yes. zoning. It doesn't sound it's like you're actually asking what they need. So if the if the questions are phrased more on a personal level, and then people think about their needs and you hear what they need, then you may think, oh, they probably need a detached. Mm -hmm. But it's different, you know what I mean? Like if, because that's what I think is many times in the way that people feel they're starting to be regulated. I feel like they could be two separate questions. One could be about the neighborhood, yeah. Yeah. and one could be about you. I and mean, yeah. we did, we touched on it a little bit, and the, the results are out now with the Birch survey. Mm -hmm. We did ask about one question about suitability of housing and does it suit your future needs? So there was a question there, and I don't remember the results yeah. off the top of my head. But I think actually yeah. there was quite a big response in that, that no, this housing isn't suitable. Like a lot of them were suitable, which I was really, really happy to see. Like most people's housing in terms of quality and cost and size were suitable, but it was the future needs that were most noticeably not. Which doesn't surprise me, right? Because yeah. so many of the houses have stairs and steep lots and driveways and all that stuff. So I think they could be two separate questions. What do you want to see or what are you okay with in your neighborhood? And then what do you need 
what do you need yeah, exactly. for housing in your future? Yeah. You know, like place for elderly parents, place for me to downsize, place for my kids to come exactly. here, place, yeah. you All know, personal. Like, yeah. yeah, personal questions. Yeah. Relationship breakdowns and not having to sell the asset. Yeah. Is sorry not to? Oh. Well, a couple oh. split and the house yeah. has to be sold. Well, maybe it's better if one stays so they can keep the asset. And, uh, yeah. Because it, yeah. it's wealth lost if, uh, and that's probably the time. In, yeah, case you, yeah. in case you're planning a divorce, would you like to call it? Rental ready, a trip to Ikea, for some cabinets and a few appliances, right? And all of a sudden, you've got a, you know, you've got a secondary suite where you can plan to build a detached one and share custody kids or whatever. You know, like I think you're right. It's changing family circumstances. Whether that's aging in place, yeah. adult children coming with their families, whether it's elder parents coming and staying. You know, it's all changing families. And the problem, the bottom line, it's much easier to get rid of your spouse than you ever thought. <laughs> <laughs> together and it, it might it'll probably just be like a super simple little thing it's not going to be formal but just so we all have a record of it yeah, I'll make a picture for it. yeah I'll take a yeah. picture for sure and then we'll, we'll just type it up and um, yeah and then our next meeting um, our next will it be in, yeah we'll meet in July yes, and we don't meet in August right July August. so, so yeah. on July schedule yeah. or not yeah, it should yeah. First, Friday. first Friday first Friday oh, would you like to send everyone an invite Chris? <laughs> Yesterday evening by accident. Because I'm so <laughs> Not used the first time. <laughs> 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 um, wrong day, wrong place. That's okay. <laughs> well, like, David Hawking does it as well. <laughs> well, I did it with the mayor. What? Family. She did it yesterday. What? Yeah. Oh yeah, because I thought I was supposed to be at the meeting last night because yeah. I get an invite oh, that says uh, Mayor Sandy Committee and Birch meeting tonight at six zero. No, I have no idea. And for some reason, your email reply didn't. It didn't show up for me, and then when I finally, I mean, it was there, oh. but I missed it in my inbox, so I came oh, in. Anyways, oh, oh dear. No, no, it was fine. It was interesting. It was good to have public. Anyway, let's officially adjourn this meeting. So, <laughs> adjourn at whatever time it is.